Good morning. Uh, I'm Corey Johnson, Speaker of the New York City Council. I want to thank you all for joining us today for this important hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee on the environmental impacts of the Williams Company's proposed Northeast Supply Enhancement, also known as the Williams Pipeline. I want to thank the chair of this great committee, Costa Costantinides, for convening this hearing today and for his steadfast commitment to protecting our city and our planet from environmental harm. The Williams Pipeline is a gas pipeline that is proposed to run under the seafloor from Raritan Bay in New Jersey to an existing pipeline offshore of the Rockaways. It is, an ex it is an expansion of an already existing transcontinental gas pipeline, which brings fracked and offshore natural gas from the Gulf Coast of Texas through Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama up the East Coast and to the New York City area. In order for the Williams Pipeline to proceed, it needs to receive a water quality certification permit from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation that indicates the, that the proposed pipeline will not violate water quality standards. I cannot believe that at a time when we are talking about a Green New Deal and discussing bold local legislation to limit greenhouse gas emissions of our buildings in New York City, we are still being asked to support fracking and to expand fossil fuel pipelines. This is discouraging when the health of our local waters might be impacted by these projects. As many here know, I have previously made public my opposition to this fracked gas pipeline expansion in New York Harbor. In March, I submitted comments to the State Department of Environmental Conservation that expressed my opposition to this pipeline receiving the necessary water quality certification permit. The state has until May 16th to decide whether or not to approve or deny the permit, and thus could approve or deny the pipeline. Today, we are hearing a resolution that expresses the concerns raised by this pipeline. First, the project is completely contrary to the, to the New York State greenhouse gas reduction goals and clean energy standards established by the governor, as well as our own local greenhouse uh, reduction, greenhouse gas reduction goals. Second, the toxic sediment that may be disturbed by this pipeline's construction could, could push back years of incredible work that has gone into cleaning up New York Harbor over the past many decades. Third, this expansion is estimated to cost nearly $1 billion, the burden of which will be borne entirely by local ratepayers. Williams Company stands to make a 14% return on their investment, regardless of the state of the market for this gas. Infrastructure should be built when we need it, not solely to enhance the profits of a corporation. Finally, I have concerns regarding the safety record of Williams Companies. Since 2008, research shows that 10 Williams Transco pipelines and compressor stations have exploded and or caught fire. The Federal Pipeline and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration has repeatedly fined Williams for violation of safety procedures. With our coastal communities still recovering from Hurricane Sandy and with climate change causing stronger, more frequent storms, it would be profoundly irresponsible to commit us to decades of increased fossil fuel consumption, and this pipeline would do just that. At a time when we're working to stop climate change from progressing, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in our city, and to shift our energy supply towards renewable, cleaner energy, this pipeline directly conflicts with the goals of our city and our state. Our planet is closing in on a breaking point. We have to transition from investing in fossil fuel infrastructure to clean, renewable energy. We have to act decisively, and we have to act now. And I look forward to the City Council doing our part so we can act. I want to thank everyone in attendance and everyone who's here to speak today on this issue, and I will now turn it over to the Chair of this Committee, Costa Costantinides. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, and thank you for your continued commitment to this city and to making us greener and more sustainable. Um, I am uh, Costa Constantinis, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, uh, and today we have an oversight hearing on the environmental impacts of the proposed Williams Pipeline. Uh, 
the pipeline 37 miles in length, 17.3 miles of which we go through New York waters. Uh, the planned track of the NESC runs parallel to already existing pipeline along the entirety of the proposed length. The pipeline extension is estimated to cost, as the speaker said, close to $1 billion. The impacts of such a pipeline could have on our environment and climate are disastrous and profound. New York City is responsible for 1% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the entire nation. <clears throat> and New York City has already taken a number of aggressive steps to, to, to advance goals enumerated in 1NYC. New York City passed my law, Local 66 of 2014, which requires the city to reduce citywide greenhouse gas emissions 80% by 2050. This pipeline would continue our dependence on fossil fuels and increase greenhouse gas emissions. While burning less oil and coal, burning natural gas emits carbon dioxide into our atmosphere. Further, fracked natural gas, primarily comprised of methane, which traps heat far more uh, effectively than CO2, with global warming potential value to be calculated 20 to 30 times higher than CO2 over a 100-year period. Scientists even argue that methane is 80 times more effective at trapping heat than CO2. This pipeline increases our reliance on fossil fuels and fracked gas. This is the antithesis of how we need to plan for a green energy future. As our capacity to provide fossil fuel increases, we become more reliant on systems that utilize these fossil fuels. The opportunity for investment in renewable technology and the development of green jobs to provide that energy is diminished. Further, there are some serious concerns about the quality of the seafloor sediment that would be dredged up, as the speaker spoke about. In 2016 and 2018, New York State DEC denied Williams applications for water quality permits due to deficiencies with the company's plans concerning the handling of toxic sediment that construction of the pipeline is likely to dredge up. The seafloor sediment along the path of the pipeline is said to have highly contaminated sediments. The project require a 23-mile-long undersea trench to be dug through an area that prior to the 1970s uh, sustained industrial waste and uh, sewage dumping. While natural processes have capped this toxic material in unpolluted sediment, the act of dredging would expose and release into the water columns high level of Class C sediment defined as highly contaminated. Trenching from construction of this pipeline could release dangerous contaminants into the sediment such as uh, polychlorinated bifentanyl, arsenic, and lead, which once stirred up, it could be carried further into New York Harbor, where it could be harmful to aquatic life. These dangerous sediments would be released back into the environment, back into the food chain, and inevitably into the body of anyone who consumes the products from the Mid-Atlantic's multi-billion dollar a year seafood industry. Many of us here today, as the speaker spoke about, and we followed his lead, uh, submitted comments to uh, DEC in opposition to this project. Today, we are also hearing a resolution calling upon DEC to deny the water quality certification for the construction of the Northeast Supply Enhancement Pipeline through New York Harbor. The life expectancy of natural gas pipeline is approximately 50 years. However, the decision to invest in a natural gas pipeline subsidized by our ratepayers is an investment in past technology. It's an investment that will result in stranded assets that shareholders will absorb. We can simply not be used for 50 years. We have been told that if the Williams Pipeline is not approved, there will be no way to service new accounts in the growing parts of, of Brooklyn, but the same claim was made in Westchester. Instead, once a moratorium on new gas pipelines was imposed, uh, the, the PSC ordered the installation of geothermal heat pumps in thousands of individual homes. Only if we take a, a firm stand and, and will we get to the future that we need. The PSC will act. There are site-sourced alternatives that, carbon, that are carbon-free. If we stand to the, against this pipeline, it means we have faith in our ability to take these transformative steps. Such transformative measures are being taken throughout our region and, but they are not being taken with new natural gas pipelines. Again, I want to thank Speaker Johnson uh, and for your leadership. I want to recognize that we have uh, Councilmember Kalman Yeager of the committee here today as well from Brooklyn. Thank you, Councilmember, for being here. And with that, we'll uh, call up the first witness uh, for testimony. So uh, Ivan Kimball, Kyle Kimball from Con Edison.
Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Speaker, and members of the committee for the opportunity to provide comments today. My name is Ivan Kimball, and I'm the Vice President of Energy Management for Con Edison. I'm joined by my colleague, Kyle Kimball, Vice President of Government, Regional, and Community Affairs. <clears throat> Our comments today are focused on the current natural gas supply constraints in New York City, how this project indirectly alleviates those constraints, and how we can work together to achieve the goals, our shared vision of a clean energy future. Con Edison has been a leader in transitioning the New York City energy grid, the most complex in the world, to a grid that will facilitate the transition to a clean energy future. We agree that the climate is changing. We see that, we see that in massive storms, cold spells, and heat waves that have impacted our system. We have spent over $1 billion to make our system more resilient to the impacts of climate change. I would like to briefly explain how the proposed Northeast Supply Enhancement, or NESI, project impacts gas supply to Con Edison service territory. Although Con Edison has no role in the development of the NESI project, nor are we a direct customer, the project is one that benefits Con Edison customers indirectly. Con Edison provides natural gas to the Bronx, Manhattan, and certain parts of Queens. National Grid covers the rest of Queens, Brooklyn, and Staten Island. To cover the five boroughs, both utilities share some of the natural gas transmission infrastructure that allows natural gas to flow in the five boroughs, whether they are customers of Con Edison or National Grid. Demand for natural gas in our service area has grown 30% since 2011. That's largely due to a successful policy to accelerate oil to gas conversions, such as New York City's clean heat program, and natural gas being the fuel of choice for new construction because it is cleaner and more economical than oil. As gas demand grows, there are only three choices to meet the demand. Additional capacity on new infrastructure, find additional capacity on existing infrastructure, or reduce demand for natural gas. I'll take them in reverse order. We are already underway on item number three, working to reduce demand for and dependence on natural gas by our customers with incentives to choose cleaner and more efficient alternatives. We can talk more about this during the Q&A. On item number two, we are actively looking for ways to improve the efficiency of our existing infrastructure, which leaves us at item number one. Because all of our customers are served by the shared transmission infrastructure, if the Nessie project is rejected, Con Edison and National Grid customers will be competing more intensely for the same already strained natural gas supply flowing through existing infrastructure. This competition could result in increased gas constraints in New York City for already tight natural gas supplies, not to mention higher prices for the natural gas itself. This is a straightforward exercise in balancing supply and demand. To the extent we are not able to meet the demand needs of our customers, for new or expanded natural gas service, we would have to move quickly to declare a moratorium on new gas connections in our service area. The inability to meet natural gas demand without new interstate pipeline infrastructure has been a growing concern for Con Ed. As you know, we put in place a temporary moratorium in Westchester on new gas connections. This moratorium decision was driven by a need to balance available supply with demand to maintain reliability for our existing Westchester customers. Con Edison has a duty to deliver natural gas safely and reliably to every firm customer on the days of peak demand, which are typically the coldest days of the year. If we forecast that we cannot meet the demand for natural gas on the days of peak demand, we cannot responsibly add new customers, which typically number about 1,700 new connections each year. These are gas connections to new affordable housing, residential and commercial developments, oil to gas conversions, new restaurants, and renovations that will all have to find alternatives to natural gas for their heating and cooking needs. Replacing the demand for natural gas with demand for electricity is considered the best way to decarbonize the heating and cooling of buildings. Beneficial electrification is only beneficial when the grid is green when the electrons that are flowing and replacing natural gas are renewable. Right now, that is not the case. 
Con Edison Inc. is the second largest solar developer in North America, and yet we are not able to bring that expertise to New York State. To achieve the level of renewable electrons flowing into, New into the New York City metropolitan area, we need all of the tools in play, and we cannot afford artificial constraints that prohibit utilities from owning solar and wind farms in New York State. We have shared goals when it comes to reducing emissions, and there are numerous projects already underway at Con Edison to reduce carbon emissions. But we have to work together to create an orderly transition to the clean energy future we all envision. It is our shared responsibility as policymakers, energy providers, and environmental advocates to ensure that New Yorkers have access to affordable and cleaner energies. We know that our customers want clean, safe, and reliable energy, and they want it to be delivered affordably. We have to work together to design an orderly transition to arrive at a clean energy future that is accessible, affordable, and does not threaten the economic health of the region or access to opportunity. Thank you for this time, and we're happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kimball, for being here today. Um, I wanted to ask how much of the power energy sources delivered by your utility, Con Edison, uh, to New York City currently comes from fossil fuels? How, are you talking about the electric side or, the, or on the gas side? The gas side. On the gas side, we, all of the natural gas that we provide is a fossil fuel. Is that what you're asking? And, and what is the plan to move towards uh, more renewable energy sources on the gas side? So we filed a smart solutions program a couple of years ago, and we recently got funding uh, from the PSC for over $200 million to move to renewable sources uh, for a clean heat program, which is uh, part of the part of that program, as well as enhanced energy efficiency programs to reduce demand for customers. And what targets does Con Ed have uh, for renewable energy delivery for 2020, 2025? As you start moving five years in the future uh, on intervals, what's the plan to move towards more renewable? So that, so the program that we, we put forth, that Smart Solutions program, uh, would address about 5% of our current demand, current peak demand, over a five to 10 year period. And, and we have said that we will uh, continue to look at additional opportunities for that, but, but we don't have a specific target uh, at this point. Why not? Why is that a spe specific target? Um, we've been working as uh, the, the process has been going forward to, to work with the PSC to determine what the right funding level is to support those programs. We put out an RFP a couple of years ago and basically asked the market what it could provide in terms of uh, renewable gas or uh, gas demand reduction programs. And so the 5% that Ivan's talking about is basically what the market told us it could do. And so we're about to, uh, eventually we'll go out uh, in, in a, uh, within the year or two once we get these programs in place, uh, and the programs that Ivan talked about in terms of creating more, we have three different renewable gas facilities that we're planning on doing. Uh, we're also working on trying to reduce the demand, so uh, incentivizing heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, uh, a lot of different programs. We will then go out for a second solicitation and again ask the market what it can do. So it's a, it's a partnership we have. It's less about our specific goals and more about what the market feels that it can provide customers in an affordable way. And I know uh, you testified that although Con Edison has no role in the development of the Williams Pipeline, nor are you a direct customer, you talked about how the pipeline affects both National Grid and Con Edison in uh, creating additional connections for, um, for gas. Uh, do you all, given your experience or given what you know, have any concerns about the pipeline? Uh, no new concerns about the pipeline, no. What were the previous concerns? No, just uh, the, the normal safety concerns that, that we have for delivering gas reliably for our customers that, that go under the existing regulations and, and processes that we have. No environmental concerns about this project from everything that you know? We're not necessarily here to um, we're not here to talk necessarily to testify that this, because we're not in this project, um, we can't testify that it is something that we would support or is designed the way we would support it or environmentally meets the 
standards that we would have. It's more that we just felt like that in this conversation about making hard choices as we transition to a clean energy future, that there was not sufficient, not a sufficient conversation going on in the public realm around the fact that we were, would potentially have to do a moratorium in the city and that people didn't necessarily understand that the five boroughs were through the sort of transitive property dependent um, and it had impacts in the city. So we're not here to necessarily say this is a project that we would have done or that we are in support of the project, but rather under helping th the conversation um, that this has impacts in the city. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Uh, what is the climate impact of the gas, which is overwhelmingly frack gas from the pipeline? So I guess the, the, the climate impact of greenhouse gases in general? Or? Yes. Mm -hmm. So we, as I think as Ivan said, we believe that um, climate change is real. We are working uh, as quickly as we can, we believe, to transition people off. I don't think there's a dispute that there is an impact uh, from burning fossil fuels on our side. So, so but we, the numbers I've heard are somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 million metric tons of CO2 that will be created from this pipeline. Does that sound in the ballpark? It's not our project. I can't necessarily tell you. Uh, it's, sorry, that's we. It's not our project. So uh, we're just literally here to talk about the relationship between this project and our service. So, so how do you feel this project fits within the state's plans for greening our grid? So I think this is this is this is the crux of the conversation, and I'm glad you asked this. I mean, I think that we believe that natural gas has a role to play. So and uh, as Ivan said, at the end of the day, I think everyone in this room wants more renewable electrons flowing into the system. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any dispute about that among anyone in the room. What we are in the middle of a conversation about is how do we get there? And we believe that natural gas, that we believe that we are not in a position to deliver energy to customers <clears throat> reliably if we completely stop providing natural gas right now. We believe there's a role for the natural gas to get to a renewable energy future. There's one. Two, we have to work with people to make sure that the, the options that we are presenting in terms of ground source heat pumps, air source heat pumps, and a lot of the different technologies that are yet to come are affordable. I don't think we're, we're not necessarily having a conversation about that yet, but we should. I think the third piece is how do we work together to in terms of reducing demand um, because right now gas demand is growing because people don't necessarily feel like they have alternatives. So I think we have to work together. Well, I mean, I, I'll ask this question. I've asked this question sure. of you before, so I'm not going to stop now. Um, but you're also offering incentives to use natural gas, right? I mean, I, I've heard stories from developers about you saying to them they're looking at geothermal, they're looking at renewable, and you're saying, well, you know, you can get this million dollar or two million dollar incentive by using natural gas. So aren't we just incentivizing them to use more natural gas and not really having those conversations around renewable energy? There's a program that is for commercial developers, but that is ending uh, in one month. Oh, it's ending in one month? Yeah. Okay. Because that's, I've heard that story more than once, that they want to move. It's only, f it's only for a small amount of commercial developers who, mm -hmm. but that's, like I said, it's ending in May. But we're incentivizing that move to natural gas, so of course the, 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 the demand for natural gas is growing because it's being incentivized. Yeah, these are people who are transitioning from oil. Okay. We're trying to move them to renewables, and we're saying to them, "No, take this instead." <laughs> we're not necessarily saying take. The, we're not saying to a developer in this case that you should do this. We're saying to to somebody who's building something that because um, there's a lot of there are some choices that someone could make, but they might if they make this choice to transition from oil, there is like an incentive program. But that, like I said, it is ending. Uh, the, the, the other question I have is, how long is this pipeline built to last for? Yeah, I think in general, pipelines are built to last for 40 years. 40 to 50 years. So right. have we thought about what our energy needs would be over the next 40 years and 50 years and where this fits into that? Our approach really is to use um, existing infrastructure that we have in place um, to get through this transition period. So in terms of getting more natural gas on existing uh, infrastructure, either through compression or um, different small projects you can do on our distribution system 
um, to help move gas differently around the city, uh, again, as part of this transition program. Did the Williams uh, company reach out to you, or did they, you reach out to them about this project? Well, I guess you're not involved. This is a natural gift. Yeah, we're not involved. Okay. I mean, it's my concern is that, you know, I've, our communities have heard this story before about reliability and affordability, but my bill keeps going up every month. We see the ratepayers having to pay more every month, even though you say that natural gas is less expensive. And, you know, we built power plants in 2000 that were supposed to be for three years in environmental justice communities. And those communities, if you were born the year that they put those power plants in, you're now old enough to vote. So even though there was supposed to be a three-year life cycle, we're talking about 18, 19 years later, those plants still exist. So we keep talking about moving to renewable energy future, but we keep locking ourselves in on fossil fuel infrastructure that's going to be there for a generation. And I don't see the conversation around renewables being robust. We need to start, you know, I understand that kind of, as you've said more than once in front of this committee, what are you doing on the state level to be able to get into the solar market, the wind market? What are you doing to get to renewables? What is the plan here beyond just coming here and testifying that you're frustrated about not being able to be able to grow solar and wind? <laughs> I want to hear something else other than you're frustrated because I'm frustrated too. So we have, we have um, we're working, actively working with the legislature to get, uh, to get legislation passed. Uh, and I would say we've had some good success in Albany in this last session. There was nothing in the budget. Uh, it was not introduced as part of the budget, but we worked very hard to try to get it introdu introduced. Um, so we are working very hard at the state level to get that, and we can use, um, we can use everyone's support um, to get, because I think at the end of the day, you want as many tools in the toolkit to get to these renewable electrons flowing into the New York City area, or otherwise known as Zone J. And um, we have to have your support and, and uh, those who want to see more renewable assets, uh, we could use your support in um, advancing this idea. I mean, I want more renewable electrons <laughs> in so Zone we. J. That there's no <laughs> argument here. That yeah. I think you have a room full of people that would like to see that as well. But I think that's an interesting part of the dialogue is that when we talk about this, people have no idea that we can't do that in New York State. They think that we're just not. And I think that's, again, part of the dialogue that we want to get the message out that we are trying very hard. Again, we are the number two developer outside in North America, outside of New York State, and we want to be able to do that in New York State. People think that we are simply uh, tied to fossil fuels in a way that's um, really not true. Oh. Oh, well, you know, I think we're going to have a disagreement on a particular pipeline, but I, do we do have an agreement that we need more renewable energy in our communities, we need to start powering. We need to th rethink how we power a city um, in the 21st century. And, and I don't believe that uh, fossil fuels are, are the way for us to think about the next 50 years of our lives. Um, so I, I want to recognize uh, Council Member Espinal, who's here from Brooklyn. Um, and then, question? OK, uh, Council Member Espinal has a question slash statement. No, yeah, I don't have any questions, but I, I just want to uh, s express my support for this resolution, so I would love to be signed on. Uh, I think that, if, as you mentioned, Mr. Chair, now more than ever, we should be talking about how do we continue building infrastructure for renewable energies instead of uh, building uh, pipelines for frack gas. You know, the state of New York, the city of New York continues to say that we believe in climate change, continues to, or we made a statement that we're against frack gas, but here we are. Uh, uh, allowing for the potential of frack gas coming to a state even though it's coming from somewhere else. Uh, so instead of, uh, instead of building pipelines, we should be building uh, offshore, offshore wind, uh, l looking at how do we uh, uh, retrofit our buildings with solar and all these other great uh, ways to produce energy here in our city. So I stand behind this resolution and I am against uh, the, the Williams Pipeline coming to New York. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Espinal. Uh, to be continued. Thank you for the time. Thank you. All right, the first panel is uh, Kim Frasick from St. Energy Project, Annie Garvena from St. Energy Project, Noel Picon, uh, Surfrider Foundation, Kimberly, Kimberly Dry, uh, NRDC, and Bruce Rosen, United for Action.
four minute talk? Yeah. Four minute per person? Okay. Uh, I'll give them a chance to say anything they want to say. I think we're going to get in your chair. Give me one second. <laughs> All right. All right, so I know we started late today, and I apologize for that. Um, but I think we're going to, in order to, we have to be done by 1 o'clock. I know there are other hearings today, so we're going to put everyone on a four minute clock, okay? So just give everyone four minutes, do your testimony, and then at the end of each panel, we'll ask questions. Sounds good? And everybody knows that this is a way to show your support already, and just no yelling, no booing. So I think we're good. All right, great. Ready when you are. All right, right there. Yeah. Make, make sure, push your red button. Oh, sure. Thank you so much for your environmental leadership and stewardship. Um, I'm Kim Frechek. I'm the director of SANE Energy Project. Uh, we represent 7,500 New Yorkers that are working to stop the fossil fuel industry and to build an equitable, renewable energy system in the state of New York. The renewable solutions are available, and fracked gas from the williams nessie pipeline is not a bridge fuel. It will bring us more climate change, more poison, and a nosedive for our democracy. Case in point, Williams Company, in partnership with the deliverers of this product, National Grid and Con Ed, are currently running a false information campaign that is nothing more than a manufactured crisis to keep their unsustainable and inequitable business models in survival mode. They are telling New Yorkers that we will all be in the cold, in the dark, and that our economy will come to a screeching halt if we don't build this pipeline. And more fracked gas infrastructure expansion. This is simply an effort to keep business as usual and to create doubt in our ability to create a renewable industry in service to sustaining all life on planet Earth. The CEOs of these companies who will benefit from this pipeline making the millions per year hardly an incentive for changing our infrastructure to distributed renewables that would break apart their monopoly on our energy choices, our economy, and our democracy. We need New York City Council to express leadership for our health, safety, and democracy, and thank you for doing so. We achieved so much already. This is not the time to work backwards. We vetoed Port Ambrose LNG port together, Many of you stood up with us to Spectre Energy's pipeline in the West Village when this fracking infrastructure fight was not on many people's radars. We must not let Williams Company and the corporate utilities bully us backward. Now is the, to now is the time to demand our city and state incentivize training for our labor force to move to renewable energy, partnered with energy efficiency and beneficial electrification to create a cleaner and equitable system. Recently, Governor Cuomo and NYSERDA's Renewable Heat Division led the way when Con Ed recently called for a moratorium on gas in Westchester County. If they don't get more gas infrastructure, SANE Energy Project, along with elected officials, organized a delivery of hundreds of letters to the Public Service Commission to see Con Ed's moratorium threat and we raise them in exchange of fossil fuel subsidies for renewable subsidies for our ratepayer and taxpayer funded Green Bank and Clean Energy Fund. We have the solutions in our economy, solar offshore wind, energy efficiency, beneficial electrification instead of gas pipeline replacement. And hey, if St. Patrick's Cathedral in Midtown Manhattan can go 100% geothermal, then there is no reason we cannot create a community, uh, community geothermal loops to heat and cool our buildings. Uh, I attach for you a uh, report that we issued uh, called a panic report, uh, Manufacturing a Panic for Pipelines and Profits by Con Edison, National Grid, and Williams. And I've also attached our renewable energy talking points uh, that are notated and cited, and how, uh, it, um, how the corporate utilities are manufacturing a crisis to keep business as usual. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Hello. 
Uh, good morning, and thank you for holding this hearing and doing the necessary oversight of the dangerous and unnecessary proposed Williams Pipeline that would carry fracked gas from our neighbors in Pennsylvania into the Rockaways, a New York City community that has already seen its own unfair share of environmental destabilization during Superstorm Sandy and its continued aftermath. I and the members of the Stop the Williams Pipeline Coalition have been working to alert the public and elected officials like yourselves to this proposed pipeline and its multitude of dangers for the last two and a half years. In my short time with you today, I would like to highlight the incredible harm that the construction process would cause to the harbor and marine and human life that depends on it. The main issue that we have is the toxins that would be dredged up through the process. One of the main negative consequences would be uh, the dredging of toxins such as mercury and arsenic that have settled on the seabed. Stricter environmental laws, investments in waste treatment, and the decline of industries on the rivers that flow into the region have led to a dramatic improvement in water quality after decades and decades of rampant industrial pollution akin to the project we're currently discussing. Williams itself has documented unsafe levels of toxic substances under the seafloor all along the proposed route. Approximately 83% of the samples it collected exceeded the New York State standards for one or more metals, and approximately 33% of samples had excessive amounts of toxic, toxic organic pollutants that would require highly specialized regulation and construction techniques. It's not a question of whether these toxins exist, but a question of whether we're going to shut our eyes and keep being delusional about their consequences. The release of toxins is particularly concerning when it comes to bottom feeding marine life overall and how this will impact the commercial and recreational purposes that this water is meant for by the law. For example, the endangered Atlantic sturgeon has been making a slow comeback over the last 20 years, with the rockways being a major habitat area. Mm. As they are bottom feeders who forage for small clams, invertebrates, and fish by sucking up large amounts of mud and sand, the trenching of the sea floor and dredging up of the toxins would A, inundate the sturgeon with plumes of sediments for three to 12 hours per day, B, reduce the amount of important prey, and C, expose sturgeon to significantly higher levels of toxins uh, through ingesting them. This example of toxic interaction can be applied to all animals within the harbor, and especially a number of the bottom feeding species who make up a large portion of the biomass within the ecosystem and play a vital role in our food web. These waters are specified as having to serve market and recreational purposes and include seven fishing grounds. Any adverse impacts on these must be taken into priority over the construction of the pipeline. Toxins are passed down from one animal to the next and by entering the food chain, they will eventually make their way into New Yorkers themselves through both uh, commercial and recreational fishing and swimming. Here are some of the negative health consequences of the toxins. Arsenic causes a variety of cancers in humans. Lead leads to neurological impairments, especially in children. PCBs enter the food chain with human exposure to PCBs often coming from eating fish. The class of organic compounds called dioxins are highly toxins. Because they bind to body fat and accumulate in, uh, they accumulate in both humans and animals, with more than 90% of human exposure to PCBs coming in through food, including fish and shellfish, which is one of our main growing industries in the city. One could point to similar evidence of harms to health for any of the metals or industrial compounds we're talking about on the bottom of the sea floor. The construction techniques that will be used to bury this pipeline will also be a part of this problem. In its filings with the federal government, Williams said that jet trenching will be used for approximately 64% of the route. Jet trenching causes the most sediment disturbance and apparently it'll be used for more than half the pipeline's length, except that no process has been put into place as to what will be done to better this. Um, the fate of resuspended contaminants is dependent on many variables, variables um, that Williams has not included in any of their uh, information. And you can read the rest of my testimony. All right, great, thank you very much. Morning. Good morning, my name is Noelle. I'm a volunteer with the Surfrider Foundation New York City chapter and uh, campaign lead against the Williams Pipeline. Um, I wanna thank you for holding this hearing and I, I like to say the statements made by the council members this morning make me very proud to be a New Yorker. If built, the Nessie Pipeline's contribution towards climate change would directly contradict New York City's greenhouse emission goals, as Speaker Johnson alluded to. This pipeline would carry fracked gas, which is largely methane, a greenhouse gas 86 times more powerful in the short term than CO2. When just 3.2% of methane leaks, and gas infrastructure is known to leak as much as 11%, methane is, a, is as bad for the climate as burning coal. 
The DEC estimates that this pipeline construction will result in the release of 99,781 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent emissions, or CO2e, which is the equivalent of burning 50,000 tons of coal. In 2014, New York City committed to reducing its greenhouse emissions by 80% by 2050 compared to the 2005 level. This pipeline contradicts and jeopardizes New York City's emission reduction plan. The DEC notes that, quote, the amount of greenhouse gas emissions from construction and operation of this pipeline would be significant when compared to state and regional GHG emission reduction targets, even before taking into account upstream or downstream emissions. As we all know, Hurricane Sandy caused massive damage to New York City as a whole, from Rockaways to Coney Island to Lower Manhattan to Staten Island, and the list goes on and on. Climate scientists agree that it is only a matter of time before a new superstorm would bring the same kind of damage. To climate-proof, quote, Lower Manhattan and prevent similar catastrophic damage from another inevitable superstorm, Mayor de Blasio recently proposed using landfill to artificially extend the southern tip of Manhattan, an estimated $10 billion project. As the mayor has said, cities like New York are facing down the greatest threat to our survival on our own. Climate change has put New York City in such a vulnerable and precarious position that a proposal exists to literally extend the island of Manhattan to the tune of $10 billion. This is the severity of the threat that we are facing. Given this, to not oppose this project, which will most certainly contribute towards climate change, would not only be illogical, but it would be irresponsible. The Council's own website states, quote, the Council can pass resolutions on state and federal issues that are relevant to New Yorkers. It further states that resolutions allow the Council to, quote, express a collective voice of the city. Recent history has taught us that climate change is an extremely relevant issue to all New Yorkers, and by taking action to stop its devastating impact, she will duly be expressing a collective voice of this city. New York City is one of the greatest and most progressive cities in the world. We should not allow the fossil fuel industry to make an enormous profit, profit for an unnecessary and dangerous project at the expense of our city. Instead, we should be a leader in the global fight to combat climate change. This council has an opportunity to, do, to be such a leader by passing this resolution and asking the DEC to deny the permit for the construction of this pipeline. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Constantinides and members of the committee and uh, all of the pipeline fighters who have taken time out of their work days to fill this room today. Um, it's great to see you all here. My name is Kimberly Young, and I'm a senior attorney at the Natural Resources Defense Council. As you probably know, NRDC is a national nonprofit legal and scientific organization headquartered in New York City. Since its founding in 1970, NRDC has worked hard to protect waters in and around New York City. It has been a principal advocate for pollution prevention and water protection of the Catskill and Delaware watersheds, which provide drinking water to more than 9 million residents, including those of us in New York City. I appreciate the opportunity to testify for you, before you today, and thank you for providing us the forum to comment on this really important project. As you know, over 23 miles of the Northeast Supply Enhancement Pipeline is proposed to be built very close to New York City, just off the shores of Staten Island and Queens. Part of that pipeline will be built by ripping up the bottom of New York Harbor, one of the city's most important water bodies. New York Harbor serves as a lifeblood to the city and as an important place for fishing, swimming, boating, and other forms of recreation for hundreds and thousands of thousands of people. And is home to a diverse collection of aquatic organisms, including 200 species of fish, and the endangered North Atlantic right whale, the endangered fin whale, and the endangered Atlantic sturgeon. With much hard work by the city, it's now the healthiest it's been in over a century. And New Yorkers are taking advantage of this. In New York City, the majority of shoreline along New York Harbor is designated as public space. And the national park sites in New York Harbor receive over 16 million visitors per year who spend nearly $560 million in communities near the parks. But all, this, is pro all this progress could be undermined if the Northeast Enhancement Pipeline goes forward. The vast majority of the pipeline in New York will be constructed using a trenching method, ripping up over one million cubic yards of sediment from the ocean floor. These activities would harm any living thing that lived in the project's path. It would also suspend sediments in the water, clogging fish gills, burying eggs, and making it too cloudy for aquatic animals to forage and migrate. 
Indeed, aquatic animals in an area larger than Central Park, about 945 acres of seafloor, would experience an increase in suspended sediment that could interfere with nearly every activity necessary to sustain, sustain life there. The pipeline developer also acknowledges that there are dangerous levels of toxic contaminants like PCBs, mercury, and copper in the sediment that creates a, highly potential, a high potential for sediments to be toxic to aquatic life. Levels of mercury and copper would be so high that they would exceed state water quality standards for these chemicals. And once contaminants enter an animal, they can move up the food chain, potentially harming and killing organisms that were not directly exposed to the contaminants in the first place. New York City has an important role to play in the future of this pipeline. Before it moves forward, the Northeast Supply Enhancement Pipeline must obtain several federal and state approvals. Without these approvals, the pipeline can't go forward. And as you're aware, New York State is currently considering granting the pipeline a water quality certification in accordance with Section 401 of the Clean Water Act. This is one of the very few opportunities New York State has to stop this pipeline. And before New York State makes its decision on May 16th, the City Council can pass a resolution calling upon New York State to deny water quality certification permit for the construction of the Northeast Supply Enhancement Pipeline through New York Harbor. This would send a powerful signal to the state that New Yorkers are not interested in hosting a frack gas pipeline through one of their most important water bodies and would put pressure on the state to respond in kind. In short, NRDC believes that New York, the Northeast Supply Enhancement Pipeline must be stopped for the health and safety of all New Yorkers and for the protection of our sacred waterways. We strongly support a resolution against the Northeast Supply Enhancement Pipeline. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning and thank you for the opportunity to, to speak. Um, I guess I wasn't amazed by hearing the utility reps um, talk about um, meeting customer de demand. I live in a co-op um, that had decided to um, do the dual um, use when it had to get out of the, the uh, more polluting oil on that. The Council of Co-ops and, and um, Condominiums um, in New York um, has only one story that it tells its members, and that's about tapping into the frack gas. Um, that is a result in part of both the previous mayoralty, the real estate policies of which continue in this mayoralty, as well as, of course, the Real Estate Board and the Partnership for New York. I think it'd be critical to note one, the, the major real estate investors um, in the city and globally are also invested in natural resources. Natural resources include oil, natural gas, coal, fissionable material, and of course, um, the rare earths that power everybody's cell phones. Um, so they're here in that. We have a problem also of not only Con Ed, but natural, National Grid. National Grid has a terrible safety record. Um, the example of which took place during Sandy, um, despite warnings from the staff of a loss of over 1,000 homes in Breezy Point. That's very important because the then mayor's priority within a week of Sandy hitting was to get a new high pressure gas pipeline constructed under Jamaica Bay and the Rockaway Peninsula. And then after that um, was to push through another high pressure um, gas pipeline under the Hudson River between Jersey City and the west side of Manhattan, which in fact, um, the now speaker participated in the demonstration um, against. So we seem to go, be going in one way. As was said by the reps, they don't even have um, the conversion interests on, on their um, scope. And it's not like we don't have the ability to do anything. At this point in time, New York City is in the top 10 cities in installed solar capacity not on a per capita basis, we have a way to go, but one of the organizations that I support, We Act, um, does such um, installations. The other thing is the technologies have been existing and been used in New York and have improved. An example is a building that was built in the 80s, the gymnasium of, of Pratt Institute in Brooklyn taps into the aquifer for its heating and cooling. 
And if you just want to use water for the um, non-potable water for protection of a building, there's a 100-year-old-plus landmark across the street named the Woolworth Building, and that's what they use. So it's not like we don't create the technology and know how to use it. Um, it's more like there's an indifference to, do, to doing that, and there are invested interests um, in it that don't want us to do that. So if New York is going to be more serious than saying um, we know the science, um, and walk the other way, it has to say absolutely no, and it has to go forward very quickly to conservation and renewable resources. Thank you very much. Thank you. So you, you've, asked, you've answered most of my questions already um, when it comes to marine life uh, in Jamaica Bay, um, seeing the resurgence of so many new wildlife there that uh, were lost for a very long time. Um, if you wanted to sort of expand, I know we're seeing whales, dolphins, I mean, in the bay that we haven't seen in a long time. What, what do you think this means if we lock ourselves into this construction? What do you foresee our waterways reverting back to? Sure. So um, over the past century, I, I think the regulation finally stopped all the industrial toxins that were coming in in the 70s. And ever since that point, we, this, like Kim said, this is the first time that we've had healthy waterways. Um, for the first time this year, we saw, what was the turtle named? The, the Kim's Ridley turtle um, come back on shore and lay eggs, which we as environmentalists were so excited about. And the moment it hit the news, Williams just wrote it off as a one-time experience rather than an incredible symbol of marine life that we haven't seen for decades come back to our shores from cleanliness. Um, the way that the construction is now has been created, it, there will be construction happening 24 hours a day in some form for 12 years, for 12 months straight, which means that not only will there be 12 months straight of death, but that means then it'll take three, to, it's projected it'll take one to three years for those marine life to come back to start regrowing. So we're actually locking ourselves into four years of straight death across the entire harbor, which is a major problem. And Williams continues to try to just write it off by basically flipping the math on every aspect of the, of the route, which makes no sense. Um, I believe that there's there's been a claim by the the natural gas pipeline developers that the type of harms that New York Harbor will experience will be quite temporary. Um, they certainly say this in their environmental impact statement a number of times. But I think you know a good example of the real life impacts of this pipeline can be seen um, in the real life impacts that resulted from the Rockaway Lateral Pipeline, which is a pipeline that was built in very similar, I mean, right right next to where the Northeast Supply Enhancement Pipeline will be built. And there, you just need to look at, you know, like one animal, like the surf clam, for example, whose populations were decimated after the construction of that pipeline that really never recovered. And I think that that's a real danger for a lot of other aquatic animals that rely on New York Harbor for their survival. I know that Councilmember Menchaca also joined us um, here at committee. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of you for your efforts and your work and your advocacy, and I appreciate you being here and taking your time today. I, one, one last question or statement? Yeah. I'd just like to say that the fractivists here to get the ban in the state said, and that was not the point that was being made by certain people downstate, there would be no sacrifice zones. No sacrifice zones didn't just mean 62 counties in New York State, it meant we did not want the sacrifice of the citizens of our neighboring states to be there. And many of the people here have visited Pennsylvania. They have seen the damage that was done. People had their fresh water taken from them without permission by a form of eminent domain. So it's our responsibility to not only not continue this, but to m do whatever we can to help make repairs with the damages done. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony. I, I appreciate all of your advocacy. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have uh, Commissioner Janie Bafi, uh, Bashi. Uh, I when a name like Constantinidis, I apologize for saying your name wrong, Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, 
for being here today from the Director of the Marius Office of Resiliency and Recovery. And Commissioner, since you are a city official, I do have to have you swear you're sworn in. <laughs> And just swearing the, the commissioner. <laughs> Can you please raise your right hand? You swear for him to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today. Always good to see you, Commissioner. Nice to see you too. Thank you for being here. Good morning. My name is Janie Bavishi. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency. I want to thank Speaker Johnson and Chairperson Constantinidis, as well as members of the Committee on Environmental Protection, for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the de Blasio administration today on the city's energy's need, energy needs, our efforts to move toward more sustainable and resilient energy sources, and the proposed Williams Pipeline. The city's electricity mix is comprised of nuclear, natural gas, and steam resources, and supports almost every aspect of life and livelihoods. Natural gas in particular fuels more than 98% of in-city electricity production by power plants. Separate from electricity, the city also relies on natural gas for more than 75% of its heating needs and a significant percentage of cooking needs in buildings throughout New York. In 2012, NYC Clean Heat was created to address the public health hazard presented by heavy heating oil emissions. Through NYC Clean Heat, there have been over 6,000 heating oil conversions from number six or number four oil to cleaner fuels like natural, natural gas. As a result, the city has achieved the cleanest air quality in 50 years, preventing approximately 210 premature deaths and 540 hospitalizations annually. We also applaud the city council's efforts to accelerate the phase out of the heaviest fuel oils for power plants. In the absence of cleaner forms of large-scale energy, especially for the provision of heating and hot water, natural gas consumption has been increasing in New York City by 3 to 4 percent annually since 2012, driven in part by the NYC Clean Heat Program. Given this growth, the utilities are now stating that there is insufficient gas supply coming into the city to keep up with growing demand. For example, on March 15th, Con Edison's moratorium on new gas connections went into effect in Westchester County. National Grid also signaled that it will not approve new gas connections for approximately 250 newly planned developments in New York City and Long Island unless the Williams Pipeline gets the green light from New York State and the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Neither Con Edison nor National Grid has yet issued a formal moratorium on new gas connections in New York City, but both have raised concerns about the adequacy of natural gas supply coming into the city to meet growing demand. As a result, the New York State Public Service Commission is currently assessing the downstate gas supply. We are watching closely and expect the results in July. Even though the city does not have permitting or approval authority over the Williams Pipeline, we will do all we can to maintain the reliability of our energy supply with the objective of ensuring that New Yorkers have access to heat during the winter months. We also want to continue to support affordable economic growth and development in New York City. More broadly, the city is working to ensure our residents have access to reliable, safe, and sustainable energy sources. We are moving fast to increase the efficiency of our buildings, in addition to transitioning heating from natural gas boilers to efficient electrified heat. The administration is working with the council to pass Introduction 1253, a major step in reducing greenhouse gas emissions from our largest buildings. In New York City, buildings are responsible for nearly 70% of the city's carbon emissions. A large part of those emissions come from heating the city's largest buildings with natural gas and oil. Introduction 1253 will require large buildings to progressively cut their carbon emissions in line with the Paris Agreement, which will mean many of them have, will have to electrify their heating. Reducing building emissions takes a significant step toward a more sustainable and reliable future. However, to support large-scale beneficial electrification, we also need significantly more renewable energy flowing into our grid. The city's 80 by 50 roadmap lays out the key steps to tra transitioning our electricity from fossil fuels to a clean energy future. Important elements of that transition include a significant increase in local and large-scale renewable power, new transmission that directly connects New York City to renewable power generated elsewhere, and energy storage and a limited amount of fast-ramping fossil fuel generation to balance the intermittency of wind and solar. Roughly half of the city's annual electricity consumption comes from 21 in-city natural gas-fired power plants. Because of the lack of transmission capacity to access power generated in other parts of the state, the New York State Reliability Council mandates that about 80% of the city's peak electricity demand must be located within city limits to ensure that the lights stay on. 
New York City accounts for over 30% of the state's electricity consumption and 40% of the state's greenhouse gas emissions. To meet the state's 100% clean electricity goal by 2040 and dramatically reduce our reliance on polluting in-city power plants, the state must invest in both new transmission from upstate to downstate and offshore wind. Otherwise, New York City and other downstate communities will be relegated to a future with more fossil fuels. Achieving the city's climate objectives is no easy task and will require active participation by New Yorkers to transforming, transform the buildings we live in, the places we work, the ways we travel, and the goods and energy we consume. We will need the state's support in these efforts. Together, we must prioritize resources, policies, and programs that facilitate this transition. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and we are happy to take any, can any questions you may have at this time. All right, so Commissioner, um, what actions would the city take if the utilities were to declare a moratorium uh, on new gas connections in New York City? Um, if the city were, if the utilities were, um, were to declare a moratorium on uh, new gas connections, um, then what will likely happen is that uh, there will be an increased reliance on fuel oil to heat uh, buildings throughout New York City. Um, th another possibility is that uh, we might see an increase in um, interruptible gas customers. Um, these are basically customers that uh, would, would not be continuous customers, but would use gas for more, more part, most parts of the year, um, but, but be required to switch to fuel oil uh, during the coldest days. Would we come up with a contingency plan based on renewables and within the city to work to try to bridge that gap? And what is, what is our thoughts? We are absolutely aggressively trying to bring as much renewable energy to the city as possible. Um, but I, as I said in my testimony, this is also dependent on uh, a more transmission to convert right. that mm -hmm. energy. No, I mean, I, I fully support that, as you know. We, I think we've had a good collaboration together on 1253, which I'm looking forward to seeing passed on Thursday, but also 1318, um, which would have the city come up with a long-term plan uh, to close these gas-powered power plants within our city limits and replace them uh, with solar and you know, hydropower, wind power, renewables. I think it, we need, and battery storage, we need to come up with that long-term plan um, to start thinking about how we pull ourselves out of this, this fossil fuel uh, paradigm that we seem to be stuck in, right? Absolutely, and the city is aggressively pursuing all those options. Yep. Um, and working with the council to do so. Yeah, no, we're, 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 we're doing a lot. And I think that, you know, as we look to, uh, you know, we, you know, my concern, and I said this before, and as, you don't have to answer this, but I mean, my, my concern was, you know, we've heard this story before from the utilities, right? It, it, we've heard this, this story of reliability, and, you know, in 2000, when California was experiencing blackouts, that, oh, we're going to put these power plants in environmental justice communities, but don't worry, they're only going to be here for three years. And then 19 years later, we're still seeing those turbines burning in environmental justice neighborhoods. I just, I feel like this pipeline, this is the same story all over again. They keep locking us into this fossil fuel infrastructure and saying, no, no, we need it. We, you know, the, the, this, you know, the, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. And then there's more profits going into these utilities. Their, their stock prices continue to go up. They continue to do well. The WIMS company continues to do well if this happens, but we're stuck with the bill. The ratepayers are stuck with the bill. The city's stuck with this, this fossil fuel infrastructure, and we're we're stuck. <laughs> right, and the alternative, um, you know, if if the uh, if more buildings are or new buildings that are coming online um, were required to uh, become dependent on fuel oil, in the you know, if moratoriums were issued, then um, we're we're locking those buildings into a dependency on fuel oil, which is a dirtier form of energy, as you know, than natural gas. I feel like they're giving us two bad choices, and we, we have to find our way out of, we need to find our way out of that, you know, A and B choice and find, uh, see our way to, to, to let her see here and, and get us into a better place. And I look forward to parking with you on that, Commissioner. Certainly looking forward to partnering with you, and, and the building's mandate is a really important step in that direction. Yep. Any questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.
All right. Uh, next panel would be Jean Belford, Lillian Belford, uh, Lee. Um, I it's from the same Ener Lee from the same Energy. I don't I don't want to mess up your name. I apologize. I, with Constantinus, I do my best not to screw up names. Uh, Sarah uh, Gronem from 350 Brooklyn, uh, Jackie Weisberg 350 Brooklyn, and then Bridget uh, Kalapski. Again, I apologize for. I apologize. <laughs> And, and the next panel after that, just so you can be ready and make sure you're in the room, so if you're going for a bathroom break, now is that moment, uh, would be Vinny Al uh, Vincent Albanese from The Laborers, uh, Lisa Harrison, Alvaro uh, Alcoser, uh, Jacqueline Saylor, and Wendy Asher, and Ken, so, so just be ready next, okay? Make sure you're here next. Right there, or here in the end. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm, my name is Jean Belford. I'm from Rockaway Women for Progress. We are a group of left-leaning women, about 500 strong, formed after the presidential election of 2016. Uh, we spent most of 2018 working hard to get some people uh, into elected positions, and the three areas that we have chosen to take on going forward as far as initiatives are the environment, health, and bias. And, and we believe that the Williams Pipeline, fighting the Williams Pipeline, uh, addresses all three of those areas. Rockaway Women for Progress is calling uh, on city council to oppose the Williams Pipeline. To accept this would be counter to New York City's goal of reducing carbon by 80% by 2050. It is because of legislation, environmental legislation, that sediment now sits atop toxins in our waters, making them cleaner and healthier. As a no-fracking state, it is counter to our position on health and welfare to have this come into our waters. There are so many economic opportunities within the renewable energy. Rockaway Women for Progress, in conjunction with Sane Energy, has worked to um, send messages to local elected officials and Gover Governor Cuomo through letter writing and postcards to the tune of hundreds. Um, we take this very seriously as a group. Uh, we don't want to increase our reliance on this form of energy. Uh, and I'd like to also speak from a, a resident, a lifetime resident of Rockaway. So um, people from Rockaway are a, a very gritty bunch. And we have had in the last 20 years our, our very fair share of fights. I come from a long line of firemen. Uh, my stepfather had been recently retired from, as an iron worker and New York City fireman on the day of 9-11. He spent months down there um, on the pile digging through the debris as a fireman by day and uh, cutting through steel at night. And so I, I address this part of it because um, I sat in the DEC uh, <clears throat> forum at Beach Channel High School where union workers felt very strongly about having uh, this job the jobs that would come with the Williams Pipeline. And so that's a really hard thing for someone from Rockaway to hear because we are very, very union proud. And um, my stepfather was told by the EPA 
at the time that the air was safe to breathe. And he has since passed from uh, cancer related to 9-11. And um, so it's really important to understand that uh, Rockway in particular, New York City in particular, takes um, being in unions and unions having jobs very, very, very sh uh, seriously. But these jobs that would come from this pipeline are so very temporary that uh, we encourage two things, that, that there are jobs that can come from renewables. Um, and uh, it's dangerous to kind of prey upon our vulnerability or our uh, um, strength as union members in Rockaway uh, to, to, to feel that we should be pressured into wanting this pipeline because of that. And this is really an environmental issue and shouldn't just be an economic issue. Hurricane Sandy brought on uh, another whole sense of uh, resiliency and fighting that we were required to, to undergo. And when we, as uh, Rockaway Women for Progress, started becoming pretty political, it was very clear that conflicting bureaucracies are leading to nothing, and, and we're fighting for storm protection. So to now have this thrust upon us as a city, and literally the barrier to one of the most important cities in the world, we are a barrier island, peninsula, um, it, at, at, this, at this point, this should not be a fight that we have to fight. I, I appreciate that, thank you, thank, thank you. you. Hi, um, I didn't take off from school today. I'm here because of a serious threat directed at my school on social media last night. Being a kid today is really chaotic, is already chaotic enough. I've lived in Rockaway my entire life and opposing the Williams pipeline will make my future a lot less scary. Thank you. How old are you? 12. You're 12. I, I commend you for being here today and your bravery to speak in front of everybody. When I was 12, I didn't do that. So thank you so much for being here and, and lending your voice. Hi, my name is Lee Zishi. I am an organizer with Sane Energy Project. I am also a documentary filmmaker who has spent a lot of time traveling this country, uh, interviewing people who have been harmed by fracking and frack gas infrastructure. I wrote a lot of testimony that focused on the climate impacts, but I think Noel covered a lot of those. And what I want to talk about is kind of something that you brought up, and thank you so much for your leadership, Councilman. Why are we continue to be presented with this false decision that we need frack gas? Um, you know, to hear Con Edison say that they're doing all they can. Well, Con Edison has absolutely um, advocated for, against a, a policy called VEDER that's actually prevented us from building renewable energy. $800 million of community-owned projects were not built last year because of VEDER. What they want is to own solar. And what this, what, the opportunity that we have is to own our own energy and produce our own heating. The fact that the city is pushing for more gas over oil. Yes, oil is very dirty and harmful to our communities, but the frack gas is just as bad. I have met people who cannot bathe their kids, who cannot drink their water in Pennsylvania. I've met people whose pipelines have destroyed their water in their land. What about those people? We cannot pretend that this is clean gas. Recently, John Bruckner, the head of National Grid, put out a video saying that this pipeline is going to be con um, transporting renewable gas. There is no such thing as renewable gas. This is a fossil fuel that will greatly contribute to climate change. Also, the Marcellus Shale is incredibly radioactive. Is anybody testing to make sure that this gas is not just as bad for local pollution as, as oil? It's just insane that we are continuing to be presented with this, this this false choice, as you're saying, between A and B, that does not exist. And the only reason it exists is because we're allowing markets, as Con Ed was saying, to solve this problem. You know, the only thing that should be determining the f path forward for our city and our state is climate science. That is the only thing. It should not be markets. It should not be Con Ed's bottom line. It should not be National Grid's bottom line. It should not be Williams's bottom line. You know, I'm 29 years old. I'm going to be 30 next month. And, you know, there's a good chance that I cannot live out my entire life in Brooklyn because of what climate science is telling us. You know, we have 11 years to move off fossil fuels. And frack gas is a part of that problem. You know, as people said, this is 86 to 106 times more potent than CO2 in the short term. That is all we have. And 
if more than 3% leaks, it is worse than coal. And what independent researchers from Cornell are finding is between 5 and 12% leakage rates. The leakage rates that the government talks about, those are all fossil fuel industry reported. When independent researchers go out there with FLIR cameras that show leaking methane, we're seeing leaking from the wellhead, we're seeing leaking all along the pipeline route, we're seeing leaking from compressor stations, and we also have extremely high leakage rates here in New York City. So the only thing that Con Ed should be spending any money on as far as more fossil fuels is to fix some of these big leaks. And we, we know that this, the technology exists. We can do this with geothermal. We can do this with air source heat pump. And I'm personally disgusted to see that the city of New York is continuing to say that we need more gas. I mean, that testimony just like broke my heart, really, to see that we don't have that political leadership that's going to take us where we need to go. Because New Yorkers are ready. You know, I've been out on Rockaway all last summer. And when I tell people, hey, do you want a frack gas pipeline? pipeline out there, I got 90 petition signatures in an hour on the beach. New Yorkers are vehemently against fracking, we're vehemently against frack gas, and thank you for your leadership in, in pointing all this out. I appreciate it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, what she said. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty quick. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to cite some of the violations from the Williams Company over the past few years, but my testimony has all of them there. Okay. 2018, the state of Mississippi levied a $40,000 fine against Williams for violations of the Clean Air Act. 2017, the EPA uh, fined Williams $35,000 for unsafe discharges of pollutants into the air at the Fort Beeler Station at, in West Virginia. 2016, a Williams facility in Clark County, Mississippi, inadvertently released 3.2 million cubic feet of methane. It was cited for four poor procedures by the PHMSA. 2016, PHMSA notified Williams that its procedures for replacing natural gas pipeline in Maryland violated pipeline safety standards. 2015, the PHMSA levied a civil penalty of $56,000 on Williams for failing to adequately inspect transmissions pipeline valves in New Jersey and New York City. 2015, the rupture of a Williams pipeline in Lycoming, Pennsylvania released approximately 96,379,900 cubic feet of methane. 2015, explosion and a fire at a natural gas plant owned by Williams in Gibson, Louisiana. Three workers were killed and two others were seriously injured. 2014, explosion and fire at a Williams natural gas processing facility and major national pipeline hub in Opal, Wyoming, entire town evacuated. 2014, a natural gas pipeline failed leading to an explosion and fire at a Williams-owned facility in Moundsville, West Virginia. 2014, pipeline explosion and fire at a Williams LNG facility in Plymouth, Washington. Five people were injured. Hmm. 2013, an explosion and fire at the Williams Olefins Inc. plant in Geismar, Louisiana, killed two people and injured 114. A U.S. Chemical Safety Board investigation concluded that safety management at the plant was deficient for years prior to the explosion. 2013, an explosion at a Williams compressor station in Branchburg, New Jersey, injured 13 people too seriously. The PHMSA investigations found Williams to have uh, followed inadequate procedures in place for ensuring safety. 2013, a fire broke out in Williams Compressor Station in Brooklyn Township, Pennsylvania. While Williams officials denied there was a fire, DEP officials said they found visual evidence that an explosion may have occurred. One ton of methane was released during the event. 2013, Williams Natural Gas Plant leaked benzene into groundwater near Parachute, Colorado. Benzene is a carcinogen. In some places, benzene level was 36 times greater than safe drinking level. 
2012, personnel at a Williams owned compressor station in Windsor, New York, were venting methane gas during a lightning storm. This resulted in a big fireball and the release of remaining gas into the atmosphere. 2011, the massive explosion of a Williams Transco pipeline at Sweetwater, Alabama was attributed to pipeline corrosion. The blast was heard 30 miles away and ignited a fire that burned eight acres of pine forest. And lastly, a Williams Transco natural gas pipeline exploded in Apotomax, Virginia in September. Five people were hospitalized and two nearly, nearby homes were destroyed. And that's only a small portion of the many safety violations that are in my transcript. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Sarah Gronim. I'm from 350 Brooklyn, and I thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. I speak in support of the proposed New York City Council resolution calling upon New York State DEC to deny a water quality permit for the proposed NESC pipeline. There are many reasons, as we've said today, why this pipeline should be built, but a major reason is that we simply do not need it. The claims that Williams and National Grid make that we need this pipeline are false. I hold here a report written by Suzanne Moutet, a former DEC assistant commissioner, uh, on the uh, claims that, that there is a need for this pipeline. Uh, she shows the facts and the figures that show that it is in fact not necessary. Uh, for example, just one of many, they, they, Williams and National Grid claim that more gas is needed because of the NYC mandate discontinuing number six, heating oil. Uh, but in fact, all of those buildings with number six converted by the end of 2015. Another, Williams has indicated to NYCHA residents that their heating woes would be over if the NESC pipeline is built. But we all know the problems in NYCHA um, buildings is that inadequate investment and management. Uh, NYCHA, in fact, converted to gas 10 years ago. Only 2% of NYCHA bo boilers still burn fuel oil. There's nothing in current circumstances in New York that call for, a current, for an increase in gas supply. National Grid also argues that it needs new supplies of gas to support new construction in the future. It claims that demands for it gas will increase by 10% over the next 10 years. But this is not a fact. This is an aspiration, a business plan, right? The health of New York, indeed the future of the planet, requires that we steadily decrease our use of fossil fuels. And we will do that. NYCHA, New York City, New York City is making significant, indeed, world-leading strides on energy efficiency. City Council legislation 1253, which we enthusiastically support, means a steep decline in energy use in big buildings, hopefully to be followed by similar programs in smaller ones. Solar and then in the very near future, offshore wind will push down the demand for burning gas in power plants. NYSERDA is ramping up support for renewable heat sources that we've heard uh, referred to. And all of this will indeed lead to a fall in demand for gas. Gas companies claim that so-called natural gas is a clean fuel. It is not. It is primarily methane. As we've heard over and over again, methane is 86 times more powerful a greenhouse gas than is CO2 in the first 20 years after its release. They claim that it is a bridge fuel to renewables. If so, this is a bridge we got on in the 90s, and it's time to head for the off-ramp. We've got the technology to shift to renewables right now. We should not be building a pipeline to last another 50 years, and we very much appreciate your support in this matter. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, is that adequate? Yep, you're good. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you for this opportunity to address the committee regarding the Williams Northeast Supply Enhancement Pipeline. My name is Bridget Klepinski, and I'm here as co-vice president of the Rockaway Beach Civic Association and a resident of the Rockaways to voice opposition to this pipeline. Our civic has followed this proposed project, examining issues of safety, impacts to marine life, and water quality, who will profit, who will bear the risks and costs, and if the gas the pipeline is to transport is even needed at all. With all of this considered, at our monthly meeting in May 2018, 
The Rockaway Beach Civic voiced una voted unanimously in opposition to the proposed Williams Pipeline. In the Rockaways, we learned so much through direct observation of the water, the weather, wildlife, conditions on the shoreline, and more. Seasons are signaled by the return of the ospreys to their nests around Jamaica Bay, hearing oyster catchers over the ocean, seeing horseshoe crabs spawning at high tide, seals resting on the beach, or humpback whales lunge feeding on Manhattan, visible from the shore. I mention these because our waters are so alive, and many species rely on this healthy marine environment as habitat or feeding grounds along a migratory route, and we rely on them. The species in the vicinity of the proposed pipeline are ecologically and commercially significant. They are also vulnerable to the activity and effects that this pipeline would bring. Increased turbidity, disturbance of the seafloor, boat traffic, and construction noise, representing a few. None of us are apart from this nature. We are dependent upon clean water and vital ecosystems, economically and in countless other ways. The other environmental topic that must be considered as pertains to this pipeline is climate change. I was in my home in Rockaway during Superstorm Sandy and remained there in the weeks following to begin cleanup while trying to process the devastation. But in that aftermath, and presently, the rebuild is still incomplete and ongoing. We were glad to be with our neighbors, doing what we could to help each other and the New York community that's home. In the almost seven years since Sandy, we've witnessed extreme weather events occurring with frequency around the country and around the world. We know climate change is a factor, and we know fossil fuels and greenhouse gases contribute to climate change dramatically. The Williams Pipeline would carry fracked gas, largely methane, moving New York away from goals to reduce emissions city and statewide. I'm not a climate scientist, but had the opportunity to hear one speak recently, and was so struck when Dr. Kate Marvel noted, as the options in addressing this climate crisis, quote, you either need to take those gases out of the air or not put them there, end quote. So with that in mind, it seems New York has a sensible can make a sensible choice by saying no to this pipeline avoiding adding greenhouse gas into the atmosphere and taking crucial steps toward renewable energy. Wind, solar, geothermal, those resources and technologies exist. We have the information on climate change. We have the technology to employ sources of energy that are less damaging. And I am asking for your leadership to set us on a safer and more sustainable path by opposing this pipeline and continuing to play, protect the places we live, work, visit, and entirely depend on. With that, thank you to the committee and the New York City Council for your leadership. Thank you. I wanna, you know, as, so we have Queens and we have Brooklyn here uh, represented on the committee. Um, so as a lifelong Queens resident myself, um, you know, and yeah, I know that Kalman's lived in Brooklyn lifelong, lifelong. We, uh, you know, I, I understand the, the plights of, of both our boroughs and, and the role that climate change is playing. Um, you know, we've seen models that place the Rockaways in sunny day flooding and uninhabitable within 50 years. Um, we take that very seriously. That's why we're working on the legislation um, that we are, is to protect the communities um, that we all grew up in and to ensure their vitality uh, into the next century um, in the face of what will be, uh, as you know, President Obama said, <laughs> the greatest challenge of our lifetimes. Um, so I appreciate you all being here today and lending your voice as we look to seek our way out of fossil fuels and get those emissions moving in the right directions. Uh, so uh, Lillian, right? thank you for being here today. I am, again, I will, I will say how impressed I am um, that, you know, I, I, I will actually clap, but you guys can all do this, but I appreciate you being here today um, and, and lending your voice. And I look forward to continuing um, our conversation on how we can better make our neighborhoods more resilient and more sustainable uh, and, um, you know, as we move forward together. So thank you very much for your time and your all of your advocacy and all that you're doing <coughs> in your neighborhoods. Thank you very much. All right, next up we have Vinnie Albanese from the Laborers. I have you listed twice. I know you really wanted to testify. <laughs> uh, Lisa Harrison. Uh, Alvaro Alcoser, uh, Jacqueline Saylor, uh, Wendy Schur, and Ken Schulz. And then the next panel after that, so if you want to make sure um, that you're ready, uh, Rachel Rivera from New York Communities. I, I, I checked the wrong, uh, I'm, I'm opposed to the motion. So. Okay, so you're, you're what, Ken, what, so, okay, so I'll put you on another panel then. Okay, so put him on. Okay. Um, 
All right, so next panel will be after this would be Rachel Rivera, Patrick Houston, Robert Wood, uh, Nikita Scott, Jeremy Jones, Ariana Hernandez, and Josette Grippo. Um, so if you guys can all make sure you stay in the room for the next panel. All right. Vinny, good to see you. Uh, make sure you push a button. Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you for having me here today uh, to testify on behalf of the laborers. My name is Vincent Albanese, and I'm here to testify on behalf of New York State Laborers Organizing Fund. The New York State, State Laborers Funds are affiliates of the Laborers International Union of North America, with 25 laborers local statewide, representing over 44,000 members. I'm here today to voice our full support for the approval of the Northeast Supply Enhancement Project. While I'd like to make some comments on the environmental merits of this project that I believe are being ignored, I want to focus my remarks on a larger issue becoming all too commonplace in our energy policy debates. That issue is the continued omission of the real impacts that some energy policy positions would actually have on working men and women. It is that issue specifically that our union can no longer stay silent on. Regarding the merits of this project, I would like to reference current New York City policy. I believe this was alluded to before in testimony by the mayor's office. According to the New York City Clean Heat Initiative launched in 2012, the use of number six oil as primary heating fuel was phased out in New York City on June 30th, 2015. To date, the city has achieved 99.8% compliance with regulations eliminating the use of number six heating oil. That has only been possible through, the, through natural gas conversions. The deadline for the phase out of all number four heating oil is January 1st, 2030. The laborers believe that this is sound public policy, but they will not be, it will not be possible to achieve the phase out of number four heating oil without the use of natural gas as a replacement. In fact, Northeast supply enhancement will displace the equivalent of 900,000 barrels of heating oil, reducing CO2 emissions by up to 200,000 tons in the first year. That makes this project wholly consistent with advancing the New York City Clean Heat Initiative, which is the city's current policy. National Grid is currently converting roughly 8,000 customers per year from heating oil to natural gas. These conversions will cease without the additional capacity of NESI. A denial of this project would indefinitely perpetuate the continued use of the dirtiest burning heating sources, and I reiterate, be in direct contradiction with New York City's current energy policy. Um, I'm going to skip over some of my testimony so I stay under time here. Uh, I just want to make this point. When the laborers' leadership makes a decision to support any project initiative, that decision is not made in a vacuum. The only consideration is not whether it would simply create jobs for our members, but how that project will impact our members' families, their quality of life, and if that project is consistent with our values and good public policy. On all these measures, this project meets those criteria. Our members live and work in the community serviced by this pipeline, and the suggestion that we are simply ignoring environmental realities, which we believe are a net benefit, is both dismissive and condescending. We are not climate deniers, and while we support and advocate for renewable projects all across this state, we believe that it is the only informed position for us to take to include natural gas as part of the energy mix to address our climate challenges. I would like to quote the Environmental Defense Fund's recent testimony given to the New York State PSC to best explain our position, and they stated, our data suggests that opposing or preventing all new pipeline capacity expansion projects into New York is not an effective climate policy, particularly if that proposed capacity is right-sized. They said, let me repeat, opposing or preventing all pipeline capacity expansion into New York is not effective climate policy. Like I said, I'm going to skip over here to close out. Mm -hmm. uh, today, our voice is here to say that a denial of this project will have irreversible and long-lasting negative impacts on our members. We hope today that our voice is loud enough and that some of our elected officials are finally listening. It is our sincere hope that in the future, this chamber will do that. The hardworking men and women of this city and our union deserve it. Thank you. Uh, Benny, look, I... I have always been a strong supporter of labor. The hardworking men and women uh, of the laborers, 
uh, that are members of union throughout New York City have always had my strong support. And uh, you know, whether it's been in the Count Me In campaign or in other instances, uh, you know, we have always stood arm in arm with one another. And our, I have not, I am no way, in no way, uh, accusing the laborers of being climate deniers. I understand that you're taking a, a position that you believe is principled, and I appreciate that. Um, that you know, we, we want the, the men and women of the, the laborers to have good union jobs for now into the foreseeable future. And we want you building renewable projects throughout the city of New York. We want you, we want the energy revolution when we bring renewable energy to New York City, uh, those solar panels, those you know, wind turbines, we want you, we want it to be labor uh, and we want it to be you know, union labor that does it. Um, so our quarrel today is with what we feel is a, is a, is a, you know, a locking us into technology that is, is, is not the future. Um, and I understand your position, but I hope you understand ours as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that you know, we, what we don't differ on is that the hard, one became, hard, more, eh, hard working men and women of this city, uh, especially when it comes to, to in union labor, uh, can perform an important service, and we appreciate it. And um, we will continue to appreciate union labor as we know it's a window into the middle class. Um, but we are going to continue to disagree on this particular issue um, from all the reasons I've laid out today that I don't think you want me to lay out all. <laughs> no, and, 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 I, and, and Council Member Chairman, I, I uh, very much appreciate you saying that. Um, and I wasn't accusing you directly of being a, the, <laughs> accusing us of being climate deniers. I was just saying more broadly that's sometimes how we are in this debate uh, interpreted. And I was just clarifying that. I did leave out a lot of comments in here, which I'm sure you'll read later. I, I, um, I, I can, I'll, I'm, I'll yeah. all of the testimony, I mean, I, I read all of it, as you can and, see. Um, but again, I, I appreciate that. Um, and I would just clarify one thing. Um, it, it is not the temporary jobs that we are concerned about in this, the temporary jobs of building the actual pipeline. We're actually not going to be part of that. Um, it, it's our biggest concern is the moratorium issues and what that would do to continued other developments. So no, that, that, is, that is our view. I mean, I, I still believe to this day um, that it's a false choice. Right, that they, we've heard this from the utilities before about the issues of moratoriums and how we're going to not going to have reliability, you know, and affordability. And yet, our, our Con Edison bills continue to go up month after month after month. I'm paying more um, than I've ever paid before with a lack of a moratorium, and you know, they're continuing to tell me that it's, it's affordable when it's not. Um, so I, I have these concerns around these claims that the only way forward here is a moratorium or this pipeline, I think, is another way that we can find together that's renewable, that invests in our communities, that has good union labor. I think there's a, there's a third way here that if we all get together and figure it out, I think that, that union labor has a large role to play in that, and I hope to find those solutions where we can build that renewable New York City together. We, we hope so, too. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. The <clears throat> The Williams Pipeline would bring fracked gas into New York, emitting methane, radon, and fracking toxins along the entire route from drilling to burning. It will require a trench at least six feet deep and 23 and a half miles long under the Raritan Bay and Lower New York Harbor. The trenching will release long buried industrial waste all along the proposed route, including PCBs, DDT, arsenic, lead, and mercury. Undoubtedly, the work will be sloppy and the pipeline will not be monitored and will leak into the water undetected. Why do I say this? Because Williams has a long history of violations over many years and many projects in many states. The same violations have been repeated over and over for at least a decade. Failure to monitor, failure to follow safety procedures. We heard some examples of the results of this in, in the last group of speakers. If you get caught, if they get caught, they pay a fine and move on. And government agencies continue to hand them more high-risk projects in spite of their abysmal safety record. National Grid claims that we need the gas, but they have no data to support this claim. In fact, the data show that city and state efficiency programs in renewable energy has lowered the need for gas. Continuing to develop renewables will reduce, not increase, the demand. 
Transitioning from oil and gas burning furnaces to geothermal or air source heat pumps will drastically reduce the demand for gas. Williams and National Grid will not like that, but a drastic reduction in fossil fuel is exactly what we need, and we should not be deceived or bullied by the misinformation and scare tactics. We spent the past decade bickering about whether climate change is real and whether it's caused by fossil fuel. We've wasted time with marketing slogans like clean coal and bridge fuel. Now we're out of time. We're in a climate crisis, and the only way forward is to stop all fossil fuel development, increase efficiency, and transition to 100% renewable energy. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alvaro Alcocer. I am here as a New York City resident, business owner, and an environmental advocate. I had spent a lot of time in the water, uh, surfing, kayaking, spending time with my family and friends in the Rockaways, Jamaica Bay, uh, Long Island, New Jersey. And I seen whales, I seen dolphins, I seen a lot of marine life right a couple of feet from me, and it's incredible to experience that in a city like this. And we should be proud and protect this. The ocean brings me joy, food, and excitement. It's an area that is crucial. Marine life, healthy oceans are important for our existence. I have spent the two and a half years informing my fellow citizens and community members about the dangerous and unnecessary gas pipeline of our coast. I do not want to spend more of my free time telling people about the dangers of pipelines and global warming. I want to be able to tell them that we have come up with a solution and that together with authority and energy companies, we are moving forward to clean energy. I'm pleased to hear today that the committee opposes the NEC project and um, are willing to protect our waters. Con Edison and National Grid say they cannot meet the demand for frac gas, but do not mention real solutions to create cleaner, efficient, and affordable energy. It is absurd to not have real goals, as we heard today, to work on solutions to provide clean energy. All energy providers are responsible for global warming, which increases our demand on energy for cooling and heating our communities. It is clear that climate change is real and somehow is profitable for these companies, but the destruction of our planet and profit for of a few is not okay, and your actions are despicable. I am a hard worker, and I know that jobs are important, but there are jobs in uh, clean energy, and we should move forward to that. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next up. Hello there, uh, I'm Wendy Scherr. Uh, thank you all for still sticking it out here. Thank you for your patience. Um, this, this is my last hard hat as a member of IBW Local 3. Until, until a couple months ago, I was also working in filthy construction sites. Uh, I worked alongside the laborers, the operating engineers, and all the other building trades. And you know, and that was my life until I came to realize that working to to help our society in the in the broader in the broader world was too important to ignore, and and it's a higher priority than serving our corporate clients. But I still I still love our union movement. I, I love the solidarity it's capable of. The, the accountability that comes from proper training, from the high level of work standards, and from the, the standards of safety, that it's, it's unparalleled. The job security, the, the unions long being the, the backbone of the middle class, and how, and how vital it is to preserve that. But most importantly, the unions have the power to transform our economy. Historically, unions have been a critical component of broad social movements, from our basic labor laws to the security of a pension and social security and retirement to even low-income housing. However, most of our union movement, with most of our union movement continuing to lose power 
from the prevalence of online retail to the prevalence of unsafe non-union construction. Our building trades new, need new strategies to improve their situation long term. And the best way to do that is to make real efforts to build solidarity with affected communities. This means occasionally being willing to say no. There are some projects that will really improve our city and some that are just a bad idea. If we want to build true, long-lasting solidarity to help build our union movement, we have to be willing to understand this distinction and stand with those who have real, legitimate concerns about this proposed project. Your support will not be forgotten. When it comes to protecting our ecosystem and building a clean energy future, count me in. Great. Well, guys, thank you all for your testimony and your points of view and all being here today to take time out of your schedule to testify. I appreciate everyone being here and being part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So <clears throat> next up, we have Rachel Rivera, New York Communities for Change, Patrick Houston, New York Communities for Change, uh, Robert Wood, uh, 350 Brooklyn, Nikita Scott, uh, Surf Rider Foundation, Jeremy Jones, Rockaway Beach Civic Association. How many is that so far? One, two, three, four, five. I can only take one more. And then, what's that one down there? And then, uh, and then Mr. Yeah, go ahead. Yep, go on that panel, yes. I already called you, so. And I'll be six. I'm gonna call, I'm gonna have to split up the panel Laura Schindel from Food and Water Watch, you're gonna be up in the next panel. Adriana Hernandez, Josette Grippo, um, I have you guys in the next panel because there's too many seats <laughs> up there right now. All right, so four, five. Huh? Oh, is that Grippo went home? Okay, so then I will take Laura Schindel. You can come forward, Food and Water Watch. Looks like Griffo went home. And who we got? How many up there? Six already. We got, okay, so yeah. All right, let's uh, begin here on the left. Good afternoon. <clears throat> My name is Rachel Rivera. I am a board member of New York Communities for Change. We are a community organized organization which promotes economic, realist, and climate justice. Thank you for holding this important hearing on the proposal William Pipeline the frack gas delivers by the pipeline would cause about 8 million tons of climate pollution each year. This is, I'm sorry, that from the reports of the PSE Health Energy. New York cannot allow this to happen. Unless we slash climate pollution, New York City will heat up while slipping underwater the city will drown while we get hit by extreme weather such as hurricanes, heat waves, intense rains and floodings. It is not fair for corporations to continue to build out fossil fuel in infrastructure. It directly threatens our futures as New York City residents. It directly threatens my, the families that have beyond our borders, like my family in the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico. To be clear, the climate crisis isn't the future, it's here. It costs homes, money, health, and lives. Me and my daughter Marisol, who is in the hospital, who is in the hospital right now because of climate change, You can tell the guy, we could tell you the consequences firsthand. 
we were in the apartment in Brooklyn when Hurricane Sandy hit. Marisol was sleeping at the time when I heard a cracking noise coming from my ceiling. As I take her out of the bed, my ceiling collapsed onto her bed. I ran out, we ran out with nothing but what we had on our backs. We spent time in emergency shelter where we were, where we were homeless. My daughter still has nightmares, night terrors to this day, and she has severe PSD due to what happened in those shelters. And a lot of families went through it also. For an example, my daughter was taken from me by a resident in those homeless shelters that I had a fight for her to get brought back to me and she was gone for more than two hours and we couldn't find her. And she suffers PSD to this day if she does not see me and it, it's raining really hard. And I'm sorry, she often becomes upset during extreme rainstorms as what happened last night. It's been, she's been in and out the hospital since Hurricane Sandy for PSD. During Hurricane Maria, my mother, my aunts, and family members in Puerto Rico were flooded out. And we also lost a very close family friend. Sandy and Maria, of course, were worse because of fossil fuel pollution from companies like Williams, Conair, and National Grid. More climate disasters will be fossil fuel by Williams Pipeline, while Williams and the National Grid will make millions of dollars off the project, me and many of other New Yorkers will pay the cost. I'm sorry, well, I'm a, the rest of my testimony is there, I'm sorry. I'm, I have to go, please excuse uh, me. Ms. Rivera, I, I, we're praying for your daughter and I always thank you for being here and testifying and, and our hearts are with you and your family. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank you very, thank very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you for holding this testimony, or for holding this important hearing so that we can give testimony about our concerns on the Williams Pipeline. Um, my name is Patrick Houston, and I'm an organizer with New York Communities for Change. Uh, New York Communities for Change, we're predominantly made up of uh, low-income communities and communities of color in the city and Long Island. So as you all know here today, as if it needs to be restated, we are facing a crisis of unprecedented proportions. The planet is warming, the seas are rising, it's getting hotter, and it's because we're burning fossil fuels. We have a closing window to avoid catastrophic runaway climate change. 11 years, according to UN scientists, New York City must reject fossil fuel infrastructure, the product, the product that is threatening the very existence of our city. Instead, we must prioritize the health and well-being of the city's residents. All New Yorkers are threatened by the climate crisis. Communities of color and low-income communities are extremely vulnerable. After Hurricane Sandy, 400 buildings in 33 NYCHA developments were in some way damaged. Low-income tenants, some of which are our members, lost power, medicine, food, pets, wages from missed hours at work. Hundreds of the people that I spoke with when Camison in Redfern houses in the Rockaways and in Carlton Manor in the Rockaways spoke about their concerns about this project right off of the coast from where they live. Many of our members in the Rockaways beyond the NYCHA developments were also badly impacted. Mrs. Phipps, a childcare provider from the peninsula, had to relocate from her home after Hurricane Sandy badly damaged it. She has spent the last five years fighting tooth and nail to cover the cost of the repairs while trying to maintain the cost of the mortgage payments. Her home has been marked for, for pre-foreclosure. The battle is not over. She just moved back in her home at the end of last year, 2018. And as it stands, it's still unclear if she and her son would manage to make up the payments to get the home off of pre-foreclosure. Another member, 
of New York Communities for Change and Rockaway resident, Ms. Bowman, deals with flooding on her block almost every time it rains. She has spent hundreds of dollars on pumps to lessen the flooding when it rains, but still her basement floods. The Williams Pipeline, if built, will account for about 15% of New York City's greenhouse gas emissions. The project is incompatible with the city's own climate goals, and as has been mentioned, locked, locks us into decades more of, of dependence on this fossil fuel. While Williams is guaranteed a solid return, which falls around 14%, the Rockaways are projected to be underwater by 2100 if we continue business as usual. At that point, it won't matter whether or not Mrs. Ms. Phipps or her son were able to pay off the mortgage on their home. New York City is estimated to experience more than double the number of extreme heat waves by the end of the century, uh, or extreme heat days. That's 90 degrees or above. We're about at 18 now. That's projected to be between 39 and 52 by 2050. Sea level rise is projected to be at 22 inches by 2050 if we continue business as usual. The Williams Pipeline is business as usual. The city is planning to spend $10 billion to protect the financial district, much of which is responsible for the climate crisis. It is immoral and nonsensical to simultaneously endanger New Yorkers on Staten Island, Coney Island, Rockaway Island, Rockaway Peninsula by supporting the construction of the Williams Project. We urge the City Council to pass a resolution to reject the Williams Pipeline, and we stand behind your leadership, Councilmember Constantinides, and the leadership of Corey Johnson at uh, addressing the climate crisis and prioritizing everyday New Yorkers over the fossil fuel industry. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. And uh, I, I, just for the record, I, you know I strongly believe in a five-borough resiliency plan, uh, not just spending $10 billion uh, in one borough, but coming up with a long-term plan for all five boroughs. That's understood, and that's clear in all the legislation that you've been pushing forward. All right. N next up. My name is Nikita Scott, and I'm the volunteer chairperson of the Surfrider Foundation New York City chapter. We're an environmental nonprofit organization of grassroots activists who advocate for the protection and enjoyment of our ocean, waves, and beaches. We are 100% volunteer run in New York City and are largely made up of surfers and recreational ocean users. I'm here representing our 700 plus official members of the New York City chapter and several hundred thousand supporters who dedicate their lives to protecting our ocean and coastline. And I thank you for this opportunity to testify. As an environmental organization, we are of course extremely concerned and our allies against the pipeline here today have done an incredible job at depicting the environmental threats of this pipeline. And what I hope to do today is to continue on from these points and paint a picture of what the environmental impact means for New Yorkers in a broader sense, how it will impact our lives each and every day in ways that you might not immediately be considering. New York City's efforts to clean up and care for our waters has been successful so far, but it's a constant work in progress. We are now seeing a resurgence of wildlife and higher instances of safe water quality, all of which have enabled New Yorkers to enjoy their natural resources without risk to our health. Our waters are now so clean that they are the backbone of a booming and vibrant ocean economy. New York is the nation's third largest ocean economy. Overall, it generates 11 billion in wages and 23 billion in GDP. Jeopardizing our water jeopardizes an estimated 300,000 jobs at the very least. The port of New York and New Jersey itself is the largest on the Atlantic seaboard, supporting 400,000 indirect jobs and 229,000 direct jobs, generating 90 billion in combined personal and business income and $8.5 billion in federal, state and local taxes. This is all because of our clean water. A study carried out by the Surfrider Foundation found that when New Yorkers visit, visit the beach in New York, they spend on average $56 per person per visit, including transport, food, and shopping at local businesses. Considering that the Rockaways attracts millions of beachgoers and ocean users each year, with 5 billion visitors recorded in the summer of 2018 alone, it's yet another indicator of the significance of clean water for the economic prosperity of our city. The environmental impacts of this proposed pipeline are not just going to impact the environment and the state of the waters. The quality of our water and the use of our coastline is so intrinsically linked to our economy that the environmental impacts are economic impacts for New Yorkers. 
As the City Council considers establishing an Office of the Waterfront, a coordinating body in the Mayor's Office to create and manage an overall vision for our 520 miles of waterfront, this further signifies the substantial investment in our waterfront by the City Government and the critical role our waters play in the fabric of our city. Such investment and future planning must be matched by efforts to protect our waters that con contribute so much to this city from an economic, social and cultural perspective. To secure the future of the blue economy of New York City and the health and safety of our waters, I urge you to stop the proposed Williams Pipeline from threatening one of New York's most valuable assets, our water and our people. Hi, my name is Robert Wood. I'm an organizer with the Climate Justice Group 350 Brooklyn, uh, and I'm here today to urge the council to pass this resolution against the Williams Pipeline, and I thank you for holding this hearing. Others today have spoken about the fact that we don't need this pipeline. Uh, they've talked about converted boilers and recently added gas capacity and growth decoupled from demand, and they've all been 100% right. What I want to talk about today instead is the complete insanity of having to have this conversation in the first place. It is not our job as citizens to have to prove the lack of need for contentious billion dollar infrastructure projects in this city. And it speaks to how accustomed we've become to a broken regulatory process that our doing so might seem strange. But this is where we are, forced to intervene because a profit seeking utility is capitalizing on the complete failure of state and federal regulators to do their jobs. FERC, the federal agency whose permit Williams uh, must have to go forward, hasn't assessed the need for this pipeline at all. Instead, it has merely assumed the need for it based on National Grid's contractual promises to buy the pipeline's gas. This says something about gas markets, but it says nothing about local gas need. On the state level, the Public Service Commission seems to have similarly turned a blind eye, remaining silent on the question of need when it could have spoken up and said something to ease public tension. And as for state level permitting, despite the vaunted authority New York has to block pipelines, it has no legal ability to do so based on a lack of need. It has only the 401 water quality certification meant to protect fish. This is the regulatory blind spot that National Grid is taking advantage of to push more gas on New Yorkers, and it is important that the council see it as such. It is what is enabling a monopoly utility to say anything at once, including making threats of a gas moratorium, moratorium to scare the public into approving destructive gas infrastructure that it doesn't need. And yet, as further proof of how accustomed we've become to a backward system, Politicians have welcomed National Grid into their offices, studied their charts and graphs with furrowed brows, and listened intently as the company that stands to profit handsomely off of this pipeline makes the sole case that it is needed. This is taking advice from the fox about the hen house. Uh, lest it be forgotten, National Grid is a private corporation behold beholden to shareholders, not the public good. That is why, when asked to provide us with information on market need, they responded that it was proprietary information but the truth is that the information it has is information they wouldn't want us to see. We need you, the City Council, to step in and stand up for New Yorkers where the regulatory apparatus has failed. We need you to be suspicious of the fact that no actual data beyond tired PR points has actually been presented by National Grid to make its case, and certainly no data that responds to our detailed 30-page report refuting its claims. We need you to be bold and pass a resolution against this pipeline. In a few days, you'll vote on legislation that would set a new world standard in regulating emissions from buildings, and it would only be fitting for you to also address the gas that causes those emissions in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi. Uh, my name is Jeremy Jones, and I'm here today to express my great concern and staunch opposition to the proposed williams Nessie pipeline. As co-vice president of the Rockaway Beach Civic Association, I'd like to state for the record that our group unanimously voted against the Williams Pipeline and have been working with our partner groups to build opposition to it, and it's nice to see many of you here. Um, as an avid water person, I spend a great deal of time uh, swimming, surfing, paddling, and fishing in the waters around Rockaway Beach, where I've been a resident and homeowner for the last 15 years. Uh, in that time, I've witnessed the incredible population growth of aquatic mammals, fish, and other sea life. Barely a day will go by in the summer when you won't see a pot of dolphins swimming near shore. We often see whales of different varieties breaching just offshore of our beaches. This is a no doubt because our waters are getting cleaner than they have been in the last 100 years. There has also been a dramatic increase in Atlantic Menhaden, which is a primary food source for numerous species of sea life. Uh, in addition to that, there have also been a great resurgence of the benthic habitat below the waves too. 
And despite the DEC raising the impact on the benthic habitat and its notable notice of denial, Williams failed to adequately address these concerns and in fact has produced absolutely no mitigation strategy to preserve the existing population in New York Harbor. Uh, my wife and I lost our home as a result of the national, uh, natural disaster uh, known as Superstorm Sandy. While we have since rebuilt and things are getting back to normal, uh, sort of, we are now faced with potential man-made disaster that is entirely avoidable. I urge the members of this body to unite in opposition to the proposed pipeline and as Williams' safety record has been less than stellar, and by this I'm being generous. Williams has also stated that this pipeline is needed to bring natural gas to NYCHA residents who need it due to a lack of heat and hot water in many areas of the city. The problems that exist in NYCHA have nothing to do with gas supply. The lack of new boilers, mechanical systems, and overall mismanagement are the problems in this case. Williams has offered no solutions to these issues, and to use this issue to coerce support is disingenuous at best and shameful at worst. The impact of a leak or explosion would be a catastrophic blow to New York City's coastal communities still recovering from Sandy. We are still working with various state and federal agencies to build a more resilient coastline, and there is no need to use 20th century infrastructure to solve a 21st century problem. As New York State works on becoming a leader in renewable energy sources such as wind, solar, and geothermal. In fact, New York has banned the process of fracking in our state. Why on earth would we allow the residents of Pennsylvania to suffer the adverse effects of gas extraction and the multitude of environmental consequences that accompany it? Why on earth would we allow our neighbors in New Jersey to deal with the proven hazard of housing transfer stations? It seems crazy to me that we would think it's okay to allow frack gas into our state while we ourselves won't permit it, its extraction here. In closing, I urge the City Council to stand with the residents of the Rockaways and the rest of New York City to protect our environment and to reject any new investments in fossil fuel economy. We are really lucky to live here, and we want to see this community continue to thrive for many years to come. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, I want to thank you for, for allowing me to speak, and I just want to uh, reiterate that I'm um, as, as so many people here, I, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but, but we know from all the scientific data and all the testimony that we've heard here how we, we don't need another pipeline. I'm, I'm here as a, as a New York City um, brownstone owner. Um, I just want to talk about the, 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 the passive aggressive um, tactics by the utility companies um, and how they they are not helping us to get past the climate crisis. Um, they put uh, utility users in positions where they are forced to continue using gas um, this winter. Um, a day before the, the polar vortex hit New York City, um, National Grid came to my house inspecting because they're, they're switching over to an automated system and they came and inspected my house and found a gas leak. And a day before the temperatures dropped to zero degrees in New York City, I was left without heat or hot water in my brownstone and forced to make a decision on, on how I would move forward. Um, I've always wanted to, to try and transition towards uh, sustainable energy use in my house. I've had uh, solar power for 11 years in my brownstone, um, but I find there's been a real lack. The, 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 the market forces are not there. They're not, the market forces that, that the utility companies have a monopoly on are, are structured so that they reinforce use of their product. Um, I find that it's, it's, it was incredibly difficult for me to transition when I was um, forced in a position where I had no heat or hot water in the depths of the winter. Um, there were no choices for me out there. And I just want to sort of add that to the mix. Um, I wasn't planning to testify today. I have no written testimony. But after hearing uh, representatives from the, from the fossil fuel industries, I was really pissed off and just had to say, I was given no choices. I don't, and, and I totally agree with you. I don't think it should be A or B. There should be a C. And I'm really pissed off that there isn't that option as a homeowner. And I was forced to spend tens of thousands of dollars to repipe my house when I really didn't want to. Well, I think it's incumbent upon us as a city to find that third way. 
Right. I think we need to start this conversation. That's why I appreciate each and every one of you testifying here today um, that we're all searching for that third way that's a renewable New York City, right, that has us in a place where we're bringing renewable energy into our city that creates good jobs, that creates a healthier city, that has a, a resilient and a green city. So that's why I appreciate um, all of you being here today um, to be part of that conversation. And, you know, I'm not taking the utilities, at, you know, testimony at face value. I have not seen that one number in this testimony. There was any, no data in this testimony. There was no uh, substantiation of their claims here today. There's just what they are. They're, 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 their statements from their point of view without data to back that up. Mm -hmm. So I've asked them for that, and I look forward to seeing that real hard data because, you know, numbers don't lie, right? So I, I want to see real numbers and real data and not uh, a continued claim, because we've heard this, I said before, we've heard these claims over and over and over again about reliability, about affordability, and all that continues to do is lock us into infrastructure that we keep promise it's, it's, we're going to move in a different direction, but we haven't. We have to start moving in a better direction. So I appreciate uh, the advocacy of residents like yourself uh, to do that work. So thank you very much. Thank you. Our last panel, um, so it's a little bit of a, a it's a Laura Schindel from Food and Water Watch, Adriana Hernandez from NYPIRG, uh, Barbara uh, Herzl, uh, doesn't say if it's a group, uh, Ira uh, Maxson, I'm so, again, I apologize if I pronounce anyone's name wrong, Carl Johnson from Local One, and Darlene Allette from NYCHA. All right, so I started on the left last time, so I'm going to go to the right this time. And <laughs> wow, that's a really thick book. Mm. All right. <laughs> Good afternoon, Speaker Constantinides. I'm sorry, Chairman Constantinides. It's my pleasure to be here. Now don't get me in trouble with the speaker now. <laughs> Absolutely not. Uh, my name is Carl Johnson. I am a business agent with Plumbers Local Union Number no. 1, the Plumbers of New York City. Mm -hmm. And I'm here to submit my testimony in support of the Williams Pipeline. As one of the oldest trade unions in the nation, our members have more, for more than 100 years developed the skills and met the challenges created by new technologies and techniques. <laughs> our nearly 6,000 members today are prepared to meet any and all new challenges. This doesn't mean we don't continue to maximize our existing technology. We would all like to live in a world where we can bring warmth and light into our homes by harnessing the sun and the wind. We know that day is coming. Unfortunately, it isn't coming next week. We must not only meet the existing demands, we must also meet the new demands of expansion and development. We've come a long way from burning trees and coals. Over the course of the last century, we've nearly eliminated the need for coal. And thanks to natural gas, we have dramatically reduced the use of oil from house to house and block to block. <coughs> Excuse me. Landlords and homeowners have weaned themselves away from number two and number four oil and invested in cleaner, more efficient burners, burners which are fueled by natural gas. As a result, we have reduced greenhouse gases, improved our air quality, and improved the quality of life for everyone. These positive developments only increase the demand throughout the region. It's a demand that can no longer be met with the existing infrastructure. Con Ed, which supplies gas into Westchester, has already announced they can no longer meet the demand and stopped adding new customers. We're here today because National Grid, which supplies natural gas to Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, and parts of Long Island, cannot meet the demands east of the Rockaways without a new pipeline. The Williams Pipeline is the lifeline for homeowners and businesses, large and small. It is the fuel for expansion and job creation throughout our region. 
There are currently some $300 billion of development projects on the drawing board for the region. Think of the thousands of jobs which will be created in the planning, construction, and beyond. Today we'll hear that there are better, cleaner, more efficient ways to power and heat our homes. We hear about wind. Sounds great. Where do we put these giant windmills? Where is their open land? Or do we put them in the ocean? What's the impact that it'll have on ocean life? If not wind, then maybe it's the sun. We can take a look at solar power. How many solar panels can we place on the roof to heat and power our homes? Where is the land for solar panel farms? We can look at greenhouse energy. Where are we going to dig a practical geothermal well in the city of New York? Yes, we all want a clean environment. And perhaps in 30 or 40 years, these technologies will certainly be the answer. Right now, unfortunately, these technologies are in their infancy. The families and businesses on Long Island need to meet these energy needs today. And for that, they'll need to access the natural gas. To do that, we need to provide the Williams Pipeline. Chairman, thank you for your time and committee members. Next. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Ariana Hernandez. I'm a student with Nightberg at the College of Staten Island. Um, I'd like to thank you all for your time to listen um, and allowing me to testify on behalf of Nightberg. If New York expands fossil fuel infrastructure like the Northeast Supply Enhancement Project, it will lock us into decades of, of greenhouse gas pollution. The methane pollution will further ignite climate change, devastate our public health, and the proposal will, je will jeopardize the long-term local economy and the safety of residents. This is an opportunity to displace greenhouse gas emissions on Long Island and in New York City. Transcontinental gas pipeline companies' proposal to expand fossil fuel infrastructure needs to be rejected. According to 4-366 of the draft environmental impact statement that Federal Energy Regulatory Commission submitted on NESC last year, construction and operation emissions from the NESC project would increase the atmospheric concentration of GHGs in combination with past and future emissions from all other sources and contribute incrementally to future climate change impacts. The New York City Council should acknowledge this and use it as reasoning alone to oppose NESC. The DEIS goes on to say that, aside from being a contributor to cl climate change, the environmental impacts would be minimal. Although this is doubtful, climate change is already wrecking havoc on our planet, and expanding the sources of energy that are leading to global catastrophe is unwise, both the long-term economic impacts of Long Island and New York City residents, and more importantly, the faith of humanity. Methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. The methane that is emitted and leaks through the whole life cycle of natural gas extraction, distribution and burning will exacerbate the global cr climate crisis. At a time when we must fully commit to keeping fossil fuels in the ground and transition to, to, um, towards 100% renewable energy. Unfortunately, progress with the state's energy efficiency measures and renewable energy production has stagnated, while new construction and expansion of fossil fuel-based energy sources continues. We recommend that any and all new development proposals for Long Island and the five boroughs includes plans for generating fossil fuel-free energy. Any new gas deal does not fall in line with the ideal Green New Deal. Climate change is the biggest threat to humanity, and expanding fossil fuel infrastructure only contributes to that threat. We need to get New York off of fossil fuels and move to a 100% clean, green, renewable energy future. Nightbrook strongly supports the New York City Council in doing everything in their power to prevent NESC. National Grid needs to meet the asserted energy needs of Long Island and New York City through efficiency measures, demand management, electrification, and renewable energy production. Thank you. And thank you. I, I remember being a member of NYPIRG, uh, you know, more years than I want to count when I was in Queens College myself. So thank you for being here today and, and being a strong advocate. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, my name is Ira and I'm a New Yorker, but more important, I am an earthling. And like all of us here, I rely on earth to support my life. 
I speak today of my climate concerns. Natural gas pipelines are hazardous and far more expensive than, for instance, solar power. We have much cheaper and sustainable options to meet our energy needs. Use of solar power alone could reduce and ultimately eliminate our need for natural gas. For more information on practical economic solutions, I recommend Paul Hawkins' book entitled Drawdown, and I gave you a copy. Natural gas produces carbon dioxide when burned. Carbon dioxide traps heat. With more heat, water evaporation increases. This leads to devastating and unpredictable weather patterns, ocean rising, flooding, animal extinction, plant extinction, rainstorms, droughts, and heat waves. Carbon dioxide is acidifying our oceans. Too much acidity will literally kill the marine life. Water near urban areas such as ours already possess levels of CO2. We care about the preservation of plants and wildlife because we need biodiversity to survive. Biodiversity is already threatened because of habitat conversion, overexploitation of natural resources, and mass extinction. To further harm plants and animals with construction vehicles, damaging or fatal underwater construction noise, the placement of polyurethane foam which will ultimately shred, the dredging of heavy metals from the ocean floor, the spewing of drilling fluids considered harmful to humans, including bentonite clay which can suffocate fish by clogging their gills, and over three million gallons of suctioned water which will kill fish captured in its vortex are not acceptable. To increase natural gas when we should be eliminating fossil fuels is not acceptable. To jeopardize the safety of our already vulnerable water with more volatile pipelines is not acceptable. Those in charge of this endeavor and the officials who approve this project are addled and deranged by greed. It is up to us, ordinary people and employees working under these kleptocrats and their enablers to block once and for all the onslaught of these myopic, mercenary, and destructive decisions. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you for listening and for all of your efforts. And thank you, Earth, for providing us all with bodies, food, water, and air to sustain our lives. May we be worthy of your gifts. How are you? Next up. Hi. Um, I'm Make sure you push the button. Button. May I be here? Yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. All right. Thank Hi. You. I'm Barbara. I live in Southside Williamsburg, and I um, thank you for having this hearing. Let us uh, letting us speak. Um, I also I appreciate that this I appreciate this resolution that is coming forth. Um, before I came here, I had this I have this uh, bendalion. It's um, clean air, land, water. I got this in the 70s. The the this had broken and I fixed it so I could wear it today because we've all been fighting this for a long time, getting clean air and water. And so um, this is so perfect that we are having this hearing. I'm getting get tired of all this. I'm hoping in 10 years we don't have to do this anymore. Um, so with the Green New Deal, it's, it, it's just, it doesn't work at all. It's um, fossil fuels, we don't want that. Con Ed should see this as an opportunity to bring in fossil, to bring in renewable energy, to do geothermal in new buildings, to make those new buildings in Rochester, in um, Westchester, I wish it was Rochester too, but um, to bring, to have them do that instead. Have them put a, you know, a, a, a windmill on their, on their roof, you know, solar panels on their roofs, to do a geothermal Thing, you know, in the building before they build it so that they can do the piping and the plumbers can do the piping for the geothermal things. They can do the piping for the, um, for the solar heat, for everything else that we need. Um, I plan it. I tried to do it. I, there are people that are willing to do it. I looked into geothermal where I live, but they couldn't get the equipment in to build it, so I couldn't have it. But there's lots of land, empty land where they're building these big buildings. Why can't they do it there? So, and I think National Grid should become a, um, a donation to a different company to build things like build parks in New York City. I want to park over the BQE. Why can't they give their billion dollars there? We can build this beautiful park over the BQE in Southside Williamsburg. They could invest in people having clean air, clean water. Um, and then one more thing I had. Um, well, 
and that's just, um, and then, oh, and Con Ed, too. You know, it's, I already said that. So I think I'm done. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much. Uh, make sure you hit your button. All right, there you go. Thank you very much for holding this hearing today. <clears throat> My name is Laura Schindel. I'm an organizer with Food and Water Watch, a national nonprofit advocacy organization with over 120,000 supporters in New York. Uh, we urge you to pass a resolution um, calling on the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation to deny the water quality certificate for the Williams Nessie pipeline. Um, I have prepared remarks, but I do just first want to say to our union brothers and sisters, our city has uh, many drinking water infrastructure woes. And we would love to build more water pipelines rather than gas pipelines. Um, but I, my remarks today will focus on the water quality and marine life impacts of the Nessie pipeline. If built, the Nessie project would be a giant leap backwards for New Yorkers and the state's water resources. Any pipeline that is primarily built through water resources will result in negative impacts to the water body, especially during construction phase. Water resources need to be protected and the public's best interest should be put before the interests of co corporations. Water belongs to the public and should be protected and preserved for the public. Overall, a whopping 26 onshore water bodies would be affected by the pipeline. The pipeline would be constructed below the sea floor where it would dredge up toxic sediment that lays dormant from the industrial era. These toxic sediments include PCBs, arsenic, and lead, and would disrupt 14,000 acres of aquamarine habitats, including clams, crabs, fish, and more. FERC's environmental impact statement tries to justify construction in the Raritan Bay by stating that the waters are already subjected to pollutants. If anything, this highlights the exact reason why the pipeline must not be constructed. Environmental regulators should make decisions that enhance water quality rather than subjecting waters to further degradation. Construction would also disrupt fishing, boating, and other recreational and commercial activities and disseminate disruptive noise pollution to wildlife. Noise pollution would be harmful to aquatic life, including various seal species, dolphins, whales, and harbor porpoise. Endangered species, including the right whale, fin whale, and Atlantic sturgeon would also be impacted. The organisms living on or near the sea floor would be faced with sediment disturbance, increased turbidity, and noise, leading to the marine life being injured, disturbed, or displaced during construction or death. Building pipelines threatens human health, wildlife habitats, and the environment by compromising soil quality, impacting vegetation, releasing air pollutants, and contaminating surface waters and aquifers. The risks to New York's waters, Raritan Bay, and its ecosystems are greater than the purported benefits of the Nessie project. The Williams pipeline would threaten Raritan Bay, the climate and communities surrounding the pipeline. We ask that New York City Council calls on the DEC to deny the 401C water quality certificate that Williams needs for construction of the pipeline. Water belongs to the public and should be protected and preserved for the public. Thank you. Thank you, thank you all. I, I, I appreciate all of your testimony here today and I appreciate all the different points of view. And uh, look, at, at the end of the day, I think we're having several different conversations at once, right? We're having a conversation about uh, what's right for our communities and our environment. We're having a conversation on how we build uh, good union jobs into the 21st century and, and renewable infrastructure. And I think that is an important part of a component as we and we need to seek out that third way today. I've said that before already, I'm gonna say it again. It cannot be a choice between uh, a moratorium and this pipeline which locks us into fossil fuel infrastructure for the next 50 years. It, it, there's, there is a third way here that we find where we can build a renewable New York City and bring renewable energy here to our city and make sure it's environmentally sound, that it is protecting our natural resources and including uh, Jamaica Bay, around the Rockaways where you know, we're seeing wildlife come back 
uh, that has not been there for decades. Uh, we can do all of that. We can make those investments. They're investments in the future of our neighborhoods. They're investments against uh, the impacts of climate change. They're resilient. Um, we can do that. That is good for all of us and still create good union jobs and make sure that the men and women in our, that do such a great service to our community and are the backbone of the middle class can continue to be that backbone of the middle class. We can, can do all of that, but not acquiesce to threats from utility companies. We can do all that simultaneously, uh, and I believe that we can because we all are invested in doing that. So I, I thank you all for being here today and being part of this conversation, and I look forward to continuing to work with each and every one of you. Thanks so much for your leadership. Thank you. Can we clap now? Uh, yeah, well, let me actually, oh, wait, wait, wait. I gotta do the, the I gotta bang the gavel, you know, bang the gavel, and then we can, then we can, then we can clap. So I wanna make sure uh, I thank our speaker, Corey Johnson, and my co-sponsor on this piece of legislation, uh, Donovan Richards, uh, our staff attorney, uh, Samara Swanston, who is a rock star in her own right, uh, Nadia Johnson, our policy analyst, uh, Ricky Chawa, our other policy analyst who's also wonderful and amazing, and uh, John Seltzer, uh, our financial analyst. We have a really great team on this committee. My legislative counsel, Nick Wazowski, as well. And with that, I will gavel, the, and of course, the Sergeant at Arms who helped keep doing all of this. Thank you, and welcome, Keith, to the team. Glad to have you here, sir. And with that, I will gavel uh, this committee hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee closed. Now we can clap. <laughs>